the cloud. Uh, yeah, let's try to talk for maybe an hour at the most. Uh, okay. Because my battery on my headphones might run out after that. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll just let you lead it. I think I'll probably discuss where. Okay, this is Stefan Kinsella, by the way. This is going to be the Kinsella on Liberty podcast. And I'm doing not really a debate, but a discussion about IP with, um, in a, I think, uh, like any voice of reason. I guess you're going to be anonymous. And uh, I think you're an objectivist, leaning libertarian type person. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thanks for having me on, Stefan. And by your accent, I assume you're not in the U.S. Well, I, I actually am in the U.S. I'm, I'm not, so, not too far from you. I, I live in Austin, Texas. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So uh, look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. Next time you're in Austin, uh, yep. shoot me a note and we can uh, grab some coffee or something. Okay. Um, well, let me, uh, if you, you can interject if you like, but uh, so you and I were just, this is over a month ago now, so honestly, I've forgotten, but you and I were kind of uh, spatting over IP, intellectual property on some uh, Twitter or other thread somewhere. And um, so we decided to just talk about it. Um, I think we come at it from different angles and I wanted a chance to try to uh, see where we disagree, see if there's common ground, uh, see if I can understand where you're coming from and maybe uh, explain my position better, which is misinterpreted all the time by objectivist type people. Uh, does that sound roughly like what you wanted to do today? Yeah, I think it would be a good uh, opportunity to share some ideas. Uh, we, we actually have a lot of things in common. Uh, we, we do disagree on, on the topic of uh, intellectual property, but I think in general, we are, we are for um, rights and property rights and certainly for capitalism and, and things like that. So there's a lot of common ground, but this is, a, this is an area where, where we, we, we don't agree. And let's, let's explore that and let's see, um, let's, my, my recommendation, if you don't mind, I, I think we can just get to fundamentals yeah. and tr try, to, try to discuss it at that level. Uh, and, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I, I will say that up front. So I'm not here to, um, you know, debate the finer points of law. Certainly, I'm not here to talk about, for example, whether one can or should get a patent on crustless uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in bags or something like that. That's not what what I'm here to do. I'm he I'm here to to make a moral case uh, for intellectual property and. I've heard you say, Stefan, um, I think this echoes Ayn Rand's view, the, the moral is the practical. So Absolutely. if we can establish a moral case, then, then we can talk about practical things. So that's, yeah. that's I think, the, a best, better place to start. I, I agree. Um, um, I don't know if you remember the uh, famous it, uh, exchange between Reagan and uh, uh, one of his opponents where Reagan says, I won't hold my opponent's youth and an experience over him. So I, uh, I hope you won't hold my being a lawyer over me against me. <laughs> it's definitely not, it's definitely not to your discredit that you're not a lawyer and you don't need to be a lawyer to understand or have an opinion on these things. Um, and as for the details of peanut butter sandwiches and all that, um, yeah, the problem is when I point out examples, crazy examples like that, then all my opponents always say well i agree with you on that i'm not in favor of that so that all they can do is add in an ad hoc way keep telling me what they don't agree with like so every concrete example i give of an obvious outrage that comes from intellectual property law they agree with me on but then they say but but that's not what i'm in favor of and then i'm left saying well then what the hell are you in favor of <laughs> so the only way to discuss it is to have like a a, a, a discussion on principles and fundamentals so i i, I agree with you so let's talk about what morals are or what's right and wrong and then what rights are and what our principles are and what we share in common. I, I mean, I, are you an objectivist or are you a libertarian? Or are you an anarchist? What, where are you on those issues? Let me just ask you that before we get started. Yeah, that's a fair question. And, and I think it's good to, to go into that before we get into you know, details of, of my position. So let me begin by saying that, that I'm a fan of Austrian economics. Okay. I mean, I, the fact that I, 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 have, I disagree with you on intellectual property uh, 
I, I still, by the way, respect the fact that you're grappling with a, with a key issue here. And, and like you, I, I too was influenced by Ayn Rand's books as a, as a youngster. Um, Rand actually helped me form an intellectual basis, you know, from which I could grasp the concepts of capitalism. And that was... Me, that me was too, a, me too, by the way. Me too. And by the way, your name, Voice of Reason, if people don't know, that is the name of an Ayn Rand book. Yes, it is. Thank you for mentioning that. And you, the you Voice see of the, Reason. The, the image that you might be seeing on the screen is actually from the from the cover of one of the editions. It's the ah, classic the New York City Twin the, Towers, yeah. Twin Towers with the lights going off, which is mm. you may recall is the mm -hmm. is the end point of Atlas Shrugged when the right, lights most, yep. New York City. Yep. Yeah. So that's yep. kind of where I, I, I made the, the image as well. So I think we're I think we're on the same page so far. So keep going. Great. So for me it was kind of natural that I found my way to Austrian economics. You know, I, I learned from reading manga and von Bawerk and von Mises and others. So I think we, we share a lot in common. Well, what about well. uh, what about Rothbard and Hoppe? Just curious. I, I have some disagreements with, so Hoppe I view as a philosopher, mm -hmm. uh, philosoph and he, he approaches ethics in, in, a, in a way, you're familiar with it, you've, you're obviously, you've spoken many times on argumentation ethics. I don't have to tell you about it, but so I, I, I believe that there is um, an, a good intent there to try and, and get to normative principles. Right. But it, it starts with some, uh, I, I think there's a, there's a sort of a, when you start philosophizing mid, midway without getting to fundamentals because you have, a, let's say, a Kantian straitjacket. So I'm getting, yeah, yeah, little, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Yep. No, I know where you're going. I, I, I know that's the Randian critique is that you need a comprehensive philosophy to ground everything else in. And I think to an extent that's, of course, true. It doesn't have to be as comprehensive as the Randians. You don't have to know about aesthetics, for example, to have a rights theory. But, yeah, you have to have a sound overall worldview. You have to have a sound epistemology, a sound metaphysics, even a sound ethics like individualism, egoism, that kind of stuff. However, I think Hoppe and the realist Kantians and Misesians basically have that by default, um, or by common sense, even though the, the terminology is different. Like, I, I think that Hoppe, this is getting far afield, but I believe that there is a strain of Kantianism on the European continent that is more realistic and compatible with Rand's own worldview than the American idealistic interpretation. Which is what she was critiquing, but anyway, that's it. That's yeah. Probably... We can we can get into that, and 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 incidentally, I'm I'm perfectly happy to have other conversations with you on yeah 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 on ethics in in particular. Uh, so uh, just to get back to to a, more of an introduction, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Austrian economics for, answered many of my questions in economics, but having been exposed to objectivism, I. I, I felt that there were some problems at the philosophical root of Austrian economics, which mm -hmm. I, I view as the, the, the root being essentially Kantian. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, to me, it felt like I was entering this amazing, impressive building and then suddenly realizing that it needs a better foundation. That yeah. was my, my take when I, when I read <laughs> the, the amazing work. So that's, to me, IP represents a case in point, particularly since the leaders on, in Austrian thought uh, hold such divergent views, you know, the views of von Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe and others diverge considerably. So this is when one must be at some level a philosophical detective, as I, as I like to call it. So that's, that's, all, you that's, to... all, that's all reasonable and fine so far. I agree with you on that. Great. So that's, and I, I just, I just one more thing, um, because I want, to, I want to stress that we have a lot in, in common here. Um, I also recognize that you know, when, when Karl Menger and in the 19th century, the founder of Austrian economics was, was doing his major work, um, Kantian philosophy dominated the era. And also in early 20th century, uh, when Mises was making his pioneering contribution. So one can respect and admire the founders and the, the leading thought of people in, in Austrian economics. To, in fact, it's, I admire the fact that they could accomplish all these great things in spite of Correct. having a philosophy that was, you know, it was kind of a smorgasbord if you think about it. We, I, we, I agree. Th th we'll that's take, why. We'll take the epistemology, which I question, we'll ditch the, ditch the 
uh, duty ethics or deontology. We'll ditch that. We'll form our own. So it, they, they did what they had to do in making great economics. Well, this, it, is, this is why I think that these guys that you, you think are Kantians, I think they implicitly or by default have an essentially correct and realistic view. Um, I think it's in a sense not as hard as we think it is. I mean, everyone has to live in the world. So we, we even though we compartmentalize and we pretend, ultimately, most people are realists and practical and pragmatic. And this forces us to, I don't know, I think that's one reason. So like there's intuitions, there's common sense that keeps us from going too far. Even with this transgender stuff and all this modern crap, you know, people only take it so far. You know, you might say that reality is not real, but most people don't walk out of a uh, of a high rise building, you know, and assuming they they won't die. They they really just don't, even though. Mm -hmm. So people, when they're forced to choose, but anyway, that that's an interesting point. Um, so I'm with you so far on that. Um, okay. So just to, just to to, um, so the point is also that. Rand had the benefit of um, first, obviously, n knowing about Kantian philosophy, knowing the problems there, uh, and then also reading uh, the works of Mises and others, also recognizing that, in a sense, only those of us who, who lived in the 20th century or even the 19th century could appreciate that, that the man's use of reason actually leads to good things. So, it, it was it was difficult to reach these kind of inductive conclusions uh, at the time, you know, predating and like certainly in, in the Lockean era, it was difficult for anyone to to say something like, oh, yeah, and there'll, there'll be prosperity uh, of, of, of this type. So there's an inductive process that is that you benefit from having seen and having studied history and Rand then puts the, the pieces of that together. And I think there's a, so, so to me, it's always been Mises and Rand. It's never been, oh, you have to make a false choice. You, you either are all in for Mises or all in for Rand. And oh, I, I by the way, I totally agree with that. And by the way, Ayn Rand, to her credit, and uncharacteristically for her in a sense, because she actually made a lot of allowances for Mises' say deviations that she would view them. Like she obviously saw through his Kantian, um, uh, terminology or whatever, like she didn't freak out about his so-called subjectivism, which I think actually she's right to not do that because his subjectivism is compatible. His subjectivism is just uh, the concept of value, which is actually compatible with her concept of value being um, and uh, something that you and a person acts to gain or keep, which is the exact same thing as demonstrated preference, which is the root of Mises' subjective preference idea. So he's not a subjectivist in the sense that Randians use it in a pejorative to mean ethical relativism or something like that. Or maybe he was, but that wasn't what he was talking about in economics. So I think but, Rand, Rand actually appreciated Mises. I mean she recommended him in her book, and she criticized Hayek to her credit too. So I think Rand actually saw the, the good in Mises, and I agree with you. Rand was essential for me in building sort of a systematic framework way of approaching all this. Yes, and just, just to uh, also touch on what you said, the, the ethical relativism, I would recommend uh, looking at the article that Rothbard wrote on, on Mises' uh, ethical relativism. He actually used the word that Mises was tragically wrong in in his in his ethics. Yeah. So I, I I would I would just say, and and I'm a big fan of Mises. So I, I'm. This is Me not too. to. This is not to. Uh, I mean, how, how do you make such incredible economics when you're living in in an era which is dominated by bad philosophy, and you're accepting some parts of it? So this is not by any means a criticism. It's just no. a means of saying that that there's a correction that is needed. Rothbard was was certainly more Aristotelian than Kantian, but he, he and he went far enough to to describe Mises' ethical relativism as tragically uh, wrong or tragically flawed. I think is the word he used. But he didn't come. He didn't apply what what he could have done was was take a, a value based approach and actually fix the fundamentals. Now. That's, there's a lot of historical reasons why that, that was, but it, that's not necessary to, to say. But my, my point is, actually, I'm here 
to, to make that moral case. I'm here to, to, to discuss rights, which I would point out are a term from political philosophy, not economics. So we have to, you know, we have to examine the definitions that, that economists take for granted. We can't just... I, I, I totally agree. And by the way, we need to, and we'll do this as we get along, but we need to have a careful definition of what we mean by intellectual property, and we can get to that. And okay. by, by the way, Mises, to his credit, he never claimed to be a big ethical philosopher, as far as I know. So, you know, he wasn't, but you can't fault him because he didn't pretend to be, at least. That's fair. Uh, but that what that tells us is that either you have to divorce ethics from economics, which is what he did. He, he, he essentially said that values-free economics means that you don't really have to worry about the ethical component of it. And that was one way. So in, in, my, in my mind, Mises had a choice. He could either do what I would call disintegration, which is take Kantian ethics and try to somehow integrate it with his, his great economics, which would never work. So he would end up disintegrating his economics if he tried to do that. Since he couldn't do that, he just said, let's, let's create a silo Let's maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe. I just think that just wasn't his focus. He was, I mean, I, I think it maybe it's trying too hard to do this. I mean, to, to read too much into it. Economics is word fry, is value free in the sense that the nature of what economics is, and even Reisman talks about this. Reisman has an idiosyncratic view of it, like it's the study of how wealth is produced or something. But even that, it's descriptive. That's not – but the point is economics is an analytical. It, it analyzes the consequences of human action. So in that sense, it's value-free, but as like Hoppe might observe, it doesn't assume that people don't have values. They have values. So it's just a study of the implications of people acting based upon their values. But in other words, rep re recognizing the different – scientific disciplines are distinct is not to separate them as you said um it's just to recognize that they're distinct i mean astronomy is different than mathematics and physics is different than biology and ethics is different than aesthetics there doesn't mean that they're not linked or related right but they're just distinct fields of knowledge but that's the point the, the point you, you actually said it very well uh, the, the, the point is that concepts from ethics should not be uh, so separated. So, for example, ethics deals with values, and if you if you say that economics cannot deal with that, that is like saying atomic theory works in physics, but it doesn't work in chemistry. Right. So yeah, but you have, but, but, you have but, a choice. But you, don't, you don't have to apply it I, if you want to specialize I agree with in you. economics. Yeah, I, I agree, but I think that's a bit of a straw man because economics doesn't say that it can't deal with it. It simply says that economics is the science that deals with the logical and practical implications of the fact that people have choice and they act. Um, and we analyze what that means, supply and demand, cost and profit and loss and uh, opportunity costs and these kinds of things. Uh, and then and then other phenomena like you know interest rates and uh, trade and and uh, minimum wage and unemployment and all this kind of stuff so that's what economics deals with it doesn't mean that it's not relevant i mean i don't think you can be a good libertarian for example if you don't know something as a factual matter about history about human nature sociology psychology ethics Aesthetics, I mean, maybe not aesthetics, but epistemology, philosophy, metaphys all these things are relevant. I mean, no, you, you, if you don't have language, you can't even talk. So all these things bear on each other. Nothing is, is not interconnected in the universe. Um, but that doesn't mean that recognizing that one domain is distinct from another is to so-called separate them. It's just to recognize that they're distinct. I mean, to have categories, to have words, to have concepts, to have language – is to distinguish things and to discriminate in the sense, right? There's Absolutely. nothing wrong with that per se. I like the way you put that. So, so there is an in, so reality is interconnected. Therefore, our knowledge of it should also be integrated. So completely for, agree. Completely agree. And in in that sense, if if someone makes the the comment that you that you can discuss. You should make something values free because to to not to introduce values would somehow 
cause a, a disintegration, he, it, it, will, it was probably the right thing to do in, in the Kantian framework because if you try to integrate it with, with deontology, you'd be in big trouble. But when you, the point is, if we have a better system that allows us to integrate, so I would even argue that praxeology is, is a layer, an action, call it an, a layer of action that Mises had to create because he, he could not bring Kantian values into economics. He had to create a sort of a separation layer called praxeology from a, as a starting point. So separating values from action was needed because of the Kantian uh, straitjacket. May, you, may, may, maybe, may, maybe, and I, I, I think this gets us far afield, but, but that's interesting, maybe. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, uh, here's how supply and demand works. And that is not that is not a moral evaluation. That is just like the logic of what it means to act. Like there's supply, there's demand, there's opportunity cost. If you impose a minimum wage, you will tend to increase unemployment. That's not evaluative. You can link it in with it. The only reason you're interested is because you have some value to exploring knowledge or learning things or furthering human welfare or whatever, and they're all connected. That's true. In fact, my view is philosophically to exist means to have an effect on something else, but that, I think that's what it means. That's why I think when people say, oh, there's alternate, alternate universes that are parallel universes that are next to us, but they don't affect us. I think that means they literally don't exist because they have no effect on us, even in principle. But that's philosophical. And by the way, I think my case against IP does not rest upon this entire Austrian praxeological Kantian or neo-Kantian framework whatsoever. It's buttressed by it, but that's incidental. Um, I think the case against IP comes from a clear recognition of our pro-property rights pro-individual rights principles and understanding what property rights are, just simply recognizing there's a contradiction there. There's an incompatibility. So that that's my perspective on it. Uh, but but go ahead. Yeah, I think that's, to, a, that's enough background probably. Why don't you take it the way you want to take it, and I'll follow your lead. Fair enough. But I just want to say that when, when we are talking, just to finish the thought on on the, the Kantian, what I call the straight jacket, and you know, you're free to disagree with that. To, to me, when, when, you, when you create these separations and then you introduce concepts like, um, like the Menger's, uh, he, he had a, 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 structure, a mental structure of wants. Mm -hmm. so, so that is, in a way, bringing in, uh, since, since he, he couldn't make the connection to, to values, he creates a structure of wants. Similarly, Mises, creates a structure, a mental, a Kantian structure of action. And that's where praxeology comes along. And then well, Hopper, yeah, Hopper yeah, creates yeah. A, a structure of essentially argumentation and discourse. So each one of these things, so you, you, you either have the, the Kantian system in your thinking and that drives you in a certain direction. It might even limit what you can do. So, so I, if I may just say one more thing. So for example, uh, if, if you're not, if you're not in the inductive mode of observing and then abstracting, then you also give you, put another straight jacket on yourself where only new information can only come from introspection. So now you have things like, if there's a performative contradiction, I, yeah, now, now you, you got new information. But yep, other than yep, that, yep, yep, all yep. your starting points have to come from there. Yep. So it, and, and by the, yeah. it impacts every aspect of what we do. Yep. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me say something. I, I don't know how this this may be lost on most people listening, unless they're deep into Randy and stuff. I agree with so much of what you're saying, um, although people wouldn't think I do. Um, except you're talking from a Randian point of view so much um, about induction and all this stuff, and part of it, it rests upon I think an unfair caricature or straw manning of the other side. Like to the extent Rand was correct in portraying what the Kantians believe, she was right to mock it. David Kelly has this famous line, you know, like when Kant says, like, uh, the senses should conform to our, uh, our reality should conform to what we experience and all this. Yeah, that's obviously silly, but 
I think he meant something subtly different, and that's to Kant's – that's Kant's fault that he was so murky, and even Hopper recognizes this. Um, but um, I think that reality is what reality is, so I'm a Randian in that sense, and I believe that if there's another species on another planet, they would have different concepts, different history, a different mode of communication, but ultimately they're describing the same reality. And it is true that a different conceptual and linguistic framework could lead you astray. But if you keep reality as your touchstone, you can make any system basically work. It's like the different guys looking at the elephant from different angles, you know, the tail, the, the feet, the trunk. They think they see different things, but they're all observing different parts of reality, which is also part of my pro Randian, um, the, the moral is the practical view. Like, you know, it's not surprising to me that consequentialism, as some people call it, dovetails with uh, deontological truths. Um, I don't think that Hoppe is this, and these guys are this caricature of like, oh, they're trying to deduce everything a priori. In fact, I think Hoppe's argumentation ethics is perfectly compatible with and, and, and complements the Randian. The good part of Rand's approach for rights, because like even Ayn Rand herself had this assertoric hypothetical approach to ethics. Like, if you choose to live, then this is what follows from it, right? She, even she didn't try to say you go from is to ought. You go from the fact of man's nature to what he should do. She went from the fact that he has values to what those values imply, and that's what Hoppe does in his argumentation ethics. But that gets us we, far we can, afield. Yeah, and we yeah. can talk about maybe ethics another time if, if you're if you're open to. It. I'd love to to you know hash that out with you as well because I think we we would I would push back slightly in the sense that I I don't think that Hopper um, starts. So so the, the problem is it doesn't get to the fundamentals. If if you are unable to to look at uh, f facts of life as a starting point. And then induce from there, then you 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 are constraining yourself to operating at a level that is removed from that, and that's actually where many errors are possible. So when I, you're, I agree. you're picking I agree methodology, that. then your methodological uh, approach should be: let's find the me the method that minimizes our chances of error. Error is still possible; humans are fallible. But Correct. let's find the way that that at least puts this the the our senses give us information. Let's put that ahead of abstraction. Let's not put abstraction. I, 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 uh, by the way, I agree with all that, and I am more uh, Aristotelian, Randian in this whole approach. Um, by the way, I, I think David Kelly is one of the great geniuses in all this, although I disagree with him on the free will part. But um, I think that um, the essential thing is whether you're correct or not, not the terminology. So we have to you know, keep our eye on that. Um, Agreed, but it's also important to get to fundamentals. So when we it, say, it is, it is. But what's interesting is you keep focusing on Hoppe's argumentation ethics. That's not epistemological at all. That's just like his argument for rights, which I, okay, we could just. That's another topic, but I think it's actually compatible with with probably your view and Rand's view, although she wouldn't admit it. But the the real contribution of Hoppe would be his. I don't know if you are familiar with this or read it, but his uh, economic science and the Austrian method, his epistemology. So I think that is – you might disagree with the terminology, and you might think it's overly Kantian, but it is essentially realistic. He's an, attempting to combine the, the, the realm that we experience, the perceptual realm, right, with the action realm. So the teleological realm, the causal realm, he's trying to unite those into a, a realistic framework. Maybe he failed. Maybe he succeeded. Maybe he's overstating his case. But it's not an un, a dishonest uh, or, or or an evil attempt to try to uh, make us think that we don't live in reality and we don't really know what's going on. It's very realist centered. It's very uh, grounded in pragmatics and in the things Rand emphasizes, but just with different terminology. Oh, there's nothing evil about it. And don't get me wrong. Hopper is a brilliant man. Uh, I mean, he's the point is he he has his and and his his I guess in, until his thirties he was a Kantian Marxist. 
of some No, no, no. That, I don't think it was that late, but yeah, it was till his late 20s maybe. But whatever, Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so so he, his background is is in from Kant and I, I would I would say he did not explore an, a, a perfect, a, a better alternative to Kant that was available in, in that era. And that's my, that's my only criticism. No, 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 Kant. no. And, and I don't. So so the reason I brought up evil is because Randians make this extremely hyperbolic claim that Kant is the source of all evil in the world and blah, blah, blah. And even that claim is exaggerated, but it's based upon this this caricature or this or this uh, American idealistic, skeptical, moral relativist – not moral relativist, but, but uh, epistemological relativ relativist interpretation of Kant, which as even Hoppe concedes is partly Kant's fault because he was so murky and unclear in his writing. So Hoppe says, I, I don't agree that Kant meant this, but I can understand why some people think so because he was so vague. Okay. And I agree with you that like Hoppe is a little bit too dismissive of Rand's contributions, partly because he was a Rothbard follower, and Rothbard had a falling out with Rand because she was they were totally psychos and cultists, and she was you know it, it, like all this personal stuff. Um, but even even Hoppe acknowledges that like you know um, Rand didn't have personal knowledge of Kant; she wasn't a deep Kant scholar, but. Um, she had some points about her criticism of Kant's – the idealistic interpretation of Kant. But anyway, this is interesting to me and you, I'm sure, but we're getting way far afield for um, what we wanted to talk about, which, by the way, so you you still never answered the question. Are you an anarchist, and are you a libertarian, and do you believe in – like what are, what's your view of property rights? Why don't you talk about that, and then we can get into the okay. next steps. Sure. Uh, I am not an anarchist. Uh, I, okay. I'm an objectivist in, in, in the sense that I, I, I and, and this is all the way from, from metaphysics, epistemology, the nature of man, ethics, politics, economics, even aesthetics. Uh, I, I, to, to me, there's a, there's a system that is available, and if there was a better one, honestly, I would be for it. So I'm not in it to, I'm not a card-carrying uh, you know, supporter of anybody, but what yeah. I'm looking for is the best, so best way to explain the world that I live in, which, which yeah. means a lot to me. So, for example, if if Harper had uh, examined the, the the Ayn Rand's approach, because he was you know coming of age in, in the 70s when certainly it was it was available to him. So let's uh, to me the, the people like Rand and Mises are. You know they they did amazing contributions, but they they've been gone for like four decades. So to be hung up on the personalities makes no sense at all. The the better thing to, for us to do in the in the twenty first century focus on the ideas and let's not worry about whether Rothbard and and Rand had a falling out. It's to it's totally with you. I totally agree. And by the by the way, uh, you might not know this, but I, I consider myself to be an objectivist in the sense of I agree with at least the four main tenets. I, I don't even say I disagree with the aesthetics with the fifth, but I'm not like it. I'm not obsessed with aesthetics and I don't pretend to be an expert, but like on metaphysics, on epistemology, on ethics and on economics and politics, I agree with the general way she stated it. I agree with capitalism or individual rights. I agree with individual self-interest or egoism. I agree with reality and realism. I agree with uh, you know, the basic core stuff. I think she misapplied it in some ways, and she was too grandiose, but I agree with all that, by the way, and I think they all feed back on each other, and they all interplay with each other. However, I'm not too dismissive of other conceptual frameworks, linguistic frameworks, philosophical frameworks that also contribute and express these core ideas in different uh, ways, although less precisely sometimes and with more contradictions. But yeah, essentially, I'm a Randian at my core. I think, I think Great. she was wrong about and anarchy is we can we can forget the anarchy thing. I think she just was wrong there, but that's a different like so. Uh, but on IP, I think her fundamental failure was in her self contradictory rights theorizing. She was right on half of it and wrong on half of it, and that led to conflict, and that leads to her conflating. Different domains and supporting intellectual property. That, that's what I think her essential mistake is. 
but I agree with the core, like realism, individualism, reality is reality, you know, logic, rationality, reason, uh, capitalism, all that. So I think I'm with you on the core. Great. And maybe this is a good time to get into more more specifics. Go ahead. Um, having and, and and you know, you mentioned in some of your podcasts, which by the way I, I, I enjoy, um, where you've described your journey uh, through objectivism and you, you I've you've even mentioned in some places that you got into IP law because of uh, because of objectivism and then you perhaps uh, didn't find out other things about it and, and change your mind about it, which is perfectly that, fine. That, that's not quite right, but okay, okay, go ahead. That's not so, quite right, but that's fine. Well, well, hopefully that when we, when we talk in, in this conversation, and I'd, I'd welcome any follow-up discussions as well, maybe I can give you the moral and the practical back so that you can uh, uh, enjoy the practice of IP law rather than do it while thinking it is immoral. Maybe well, I'm, bas I'm, I'm basically retired now, so it's too late. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do mind. a little. I do a little bit, but no, no, no. I actually enjoyed my practice because I was good at it. And you're when you're good at a skill, it's it's pleasurable. But I just recognized what my role was. My role was to aid people to navigate a legal system, and it's like if you're a, if you're if you're a defense attorney and you're defending someone from a drug crime. Uh, you know, in a free society, your job wouldn't exist. But given that there is a, you know, a drug war, you need defense attorneys. So you're doing a good job given that it exists. So can you take pleasure in that? Sure, but then you're you're regretting the fact that your job even has to exist. The same thing with a tax attorney. Like I can help corporations um, try to minimize the tax burden, and I can be good at that, and I can take pleasure in that, I, and I'm contributing value given the tax system. But the tax system is the immoral thing that drives this the existence of this career. Or like if you're a, an oncologist, you're 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 your doctor trying to, you know, you're trying to cure cancer. Well, you know, if we could achieve a world without cancer, you oncologists would not be needed anymore. But given that there's cancer, your job is necessary. That's how I ended up viewing my job as a patent attorney, and I was good at it in those confines. Um, so I was able to compartmentalize and think of, okay, ethically should or politically should this field exist or should these laws exist with what's a good career to practice in? And yeah, for me, it was a good career, and I was good at it, and I enjoyed that part of it. I enjoyed the technological parts. I enjoyed interacting with creative people and with inventors and learning about technology and seeing how it interplays with, with capitalist, private, entrepreneurial companies and all that. So – and by the way, I wanted to mention earlier, this is, again, yet another side. You and I keep having tangents, but I will concede that there are some weak arguments for the abolition of IP, like, oh, information wants to be free and this kind of stuff, although there's a germ of truth in some of that. But there are terrible arguments criticizing people like me. Like you will have libertarians or objectivists say, oh, well, you're a communist because you think ideas should be commonly owned. I mean that's just – that's just bad arguing because it presupposes property rights. I mean we have to get to the core of definitions, principles, rights, property, that kind of stuff to get, even get to this issue. You can't just say you're a combi. I mean in my view, intellectual property is evil because it's socialistic. It is communistic in the sense that it's an institutionalized way of interfering with and taking private property rights. So then the question really is what are private property rights? How do we justify them, and what are their contents? Right, that's ultimately yes. the question, I think. And by the way, I would never call you a, a communist. Um, I, I would, where I disagree with you, is that the the way to defend property rights is not to torpedo intellectual property rights. So I'm I'm going to make that case, and so okay. it, it's probably okay. so. But but my my point is, if you if you since you support property rights in tangible things, but not in, in inventions and, and books and whatnot, uh, in my mind, there's no difference between the two. And if, if, right. if, the, the, if you attack one, you're actually playing into the hands of the left who are happy to take both down. 
And that, that's not the reason why I support it. To, to me, there, there either is a moral case or not. But it, in, doing, in, in thinking that you're defending property rights by, by attacking intellectual property rights, you're actually playing into the hands of the leftist. That doesn't make you a yep. leftist, but it, you're yep. playing into their hands. Well, the well, one problem with that comment is that, you know, the left doesn't oppose intellectual property rights and com communist states have patent and copyright laws. So it's not like it's a commie thing to oppose IP rights. Well, without, without going into, into the weeds there, but e even the, the Soviet Russia that had a, a, a kind of a patent system, it, it was never the individual that owned it. It, it was a, a, a weak, uh, it was never mm -hmm. about the individual. But maybe that's going to, into areas I mean, where we you, can... You can say the same thing about you know owning a farm. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's how their property system worked. But they, their property rights included patent rights. So they, they weren't opposed to that at all because, and I believe ultimately because the intellectual property mistake <coughs> stems from the Marxist labor theory of value, which I think Rand inadvertently bought into because of the Lockean, the, uh, the 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 related Lockean mistake of the, the labor theory of property. So it's it, like both sides focus. I mean, look, Ayn Rand was good at exposing dichotomies and false false choices, and I think she bought into one of them, which was you know, um, uh, like they all bought into this idea of labor as being this essential concept and category that has moral implications. But and I think it's, point, le it's led to communism and, and mass murder and, you know, uh, all kinds of horrors. True, but th there's, a, there's a, an error in that, in, and I just want to clarify that. Uh, we, we all know that rights, bo both intellectual and um, tangible, started off on a really bad way with, with monopolies from the crown and things like that. So the origins are very murky. But... Uh, in, in more modern times, modern including uh, the Lockean era, the 1690s and, and what have you, the, the, the people who were the natural rights philosophers of, of the Lockean type, they were focused on, on labor and they never really justified the source or the nature of property. They, to them, it was a very intrinsicist thing, like either it's from God or it's something inherent in human beings and all of that. I agree. So very I, don't, I don't disagree. Yep, I don't so, disagree with that. Yep. So Rand figured that out, and and she she actually she is not on the on the uh, on on the labor theory of value. I think it's it's this is where there's a lot of commonality between uh, Rand and Locke, but she parts company with them in in that in that labor theory of value. So to to say that she she is part of that tradition is correct, but for her it's about value creation, and it was well, not. And it, may, may I just complete the yeah, thought? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Then, then the next phase was the the Benthamite era. Actually, from from Kant was sort of coming into his own right after in the eighteen uh, late seventeen hundreds, and then Bentham comes along, and he creates this this new religion, if you will, of um, the, the greatest good for the greatest number, the utilitarian mindset. And he's the one who actually brings scarcity as the, as the source of value and therefore the source of property. So you have either scarcity or labor or value. And, yep. and then, of course, Marx says, well, it's labor that is scarce. And so he's, he's sort of blending the Benthamite view with, with the Lockean view, and then he's going off on his horrible mm. labor theory of value so that, that's, and, that's that interesting is, that's interesting I, I i would disagree with with that with part of what you said but but like i don't think that you can attribute recognizing the fundamental nature of reality being that we are human actors with physical bodies which ayn rand herself recognized when she distinguishes that she says we're not ghosts you know we have we have actual physical tangible human bodies we live in the real world we're not ghosts um recognizing that we employ scarce means which is a, a, a an austrian mises, mises concept which is true it's undeniably true there's nothing material there's nothing like uh anti-intellectual or materialistic about this recognition 
that we employ scarce means and that has certain implications. This is what economic analysis is about, implications of acting with scarce means. So we do live in this kind of world. Even Rand wouldn't disagree with that, I believe. Yes, but so for, for, for that's, Rand… That's not mystical. That's not anti-intellectual. That's not monist. It's, there's, it's, it's just it's – just, it's undeniably true that we live in a world of scarcity. Except, except that it is superficial in the sense that it – so since you quoted Rand, Rand, for Rand, man is a unity of mind and body. I agree with that completely, by the way. And by the way, Mises wouldn't disagree either because we have will, we have choice. We are actors, not behaviors. But go ahead. Well, will is, is, a, is an approximation, but let's, let's say so mind and body, and therefore that is the – so when you, when you start with that, then you recognize that the root of all property is intellectual, whether it's a farm. I, or, I don't. Okay, this is where we well, let's let's stop right there because when you say the root, well, define what you mean by property. Fair enough. But what I'm going to show in, in the in the next few minutes, hopefully, is the is that when you you it's a mistake to lump. Rand into the into the labor theory of value that that no misses, I, I said the but point. but it, but it's it's the labor theory of property so Locke had the labor theory of property that led eventually in my view to the cousin and related view of labor theory of value um, and by the way Rand some Randians that support IP I'm not blaming you for this but some people they will they will repeat things that are very labor theory of value related not property like they'll say well if you work hard at something you deserve a profit well that is that is communist that is socialist you do not deserve anything no one deserves a profit for working hard right even in physics work is motion through a distance it's not just pushing against a wall and if you in, in, embark on an endeavor and you work hard at it, it may it might fail. That's the pro there's always a possibility of failure. No one deserves a profit because a profit is the excess money you have left over after people pay you for what, services or goods that you sell or perform, and that means that they have to pay you their property, but they own that. So to have a property right in a profit would mean a slavery claim, a, a right of ownership over other people. It means you have a right to an income. It's like saying I, I put money into Social Security so I have a right to a payment. No, you don't because that requires the government to tax uh, workers right, to pay me my Social Security payments, and even if the government calls that a property right, it doesn't matter. So my point is that you, know, you can't – when you say people deserve to be paid for their work… That is actually completely false, and that is hearkening back to and based upon the labor theory of value, which is Marxian and false. And but Randians that is, that is, but that sometimes not, do that. But that is not the point that I'm making at all. I, uh, that's fine, but uh, but so some I, of your so some I, of your compatriots do do that sometimes. Well, uh, I, I would I would say that th that we need to get to the fundamentals, and so if man is a unity of mind and body, then the the and man is dealing with. With material values in the real world, so it comes down to no, 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 no. So, so here's what so, so, he, he, uh, he hold, hold on. He deals with Stephen, material Stephen, objects, you, you not mind, values. I, you should let me finish the point because I right, go go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Otherwise, you know, you, you you took it in the direction of profit, which is not anything that I said. So uh, the 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 fact that man is unity of mind and body. Mm -hmm. Then it, it comes down to you have to get to the, what is the root of property. That's what we started talking about. You mentioned sc you mentioned scarcity, and that is a, a, a cornerstone of of the of your criticism. If you start with scarcity, then you're right. If if it's all about scarcity, then intellectual property the, the, is it falls in, into a different category. It's not scarce. So all of that goes into a different category. But that's not my case at all. So in my mind, scarcity is the is a superficial. Uh, sort of a, uh, it, it's actually an invalid concept, which I will I will get to in just a minute. But that's to to me when you start with that, you get yourself in a, in a lot of trouble because you haven't gone to the root. So if scarcity is your root, and and I can say that there's something more fundamental than that that you're missing, and because of that you have taken uh, the wrong approach towards IP. That's my position, and that's what I'm I'm hoping right. to show in in a few right. minutes. Give me a second. Um, 
Um, I'll let you continue in a second. Um, I'm going to want to pause this for three minutes to go take a bathroom break. Are you okay Fair with enough. that? Yes. Um, but I got distracted actually. What I was what I was objecting to, uh, and not to disrupt your chain of logic, was your use of the of this Randy this Randy concept of values with a plural values, like treating it as a noun. That's where I think I fundamentally disagree. Um, and we can talk about that, and I'll let you continue. But um, let me pause just for three minutes to go have a bathroom break, and I'll come right back. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Okay, give me just a second. I'm going to hit pause here and see how this works. I just turned on the recording again on my side. Me, me too. I just resumed. Okay, we're back. I'm back okay. with, uh, with, my, with my cold brew. All right. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay, so maybe this would be a good time to to get into. If you, and if you don't mind, um, and and if this format is okay with you, I'll go for about fifteen minutes, um, and then maybe you can have uh, you, you know whatever you'd like to do. We don't have to be formal about it, but because the case I'm about to make is probably not that familiar to your audience. It would be go nice ahead. if I can present it in, in sort of one yep. go one. Go ahead. Time. I'm grabbing a notepad so I can take notes, but go ahead. I'm okay. listening. So we, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the fundamentals, the epistemology, and, and things like that. And we won't go into that. The goal here is to look for what is a good place to start. So when we think about property, um, what is the concept of property based on is a good place to start. Um, I know, Stefan, your, your position is, is more about scarcity and conflict prevention. And, and these are not incorrect in the sense that, that it, and it's easier to, to grasp it at that level. So it's quite easy to understand why many people would, would do that. Uh, it's, it's somewhat intuition based, and, and that's what is the appeal of it that, it, that many people can grasp it right away. But in my mind, it doesn't get to the fundamentals. And since we are talking about the moral case, if we don't get to the fundamentals, we can make some big mistakes. So uh, to, to begin, property is a moral concept, not an economic concept. And it is actually, a, you, to be more precise, it's a, it's a normative concept. Totally so, agree, by the way, but keep going. Totally agree. Thank you. So, and, and, and Rand actually is, is, as far as I know, the only person who digs, it, digs into it at, at that level, looking for, for that is, and she's applying her methods here, you know, the methods of observe and then abstract. And so you'll see the method at work, even though I'm not going to go into the details of, of that, but it's, it's very, for, for someone who's immersed in philosophy, you'll get a, a good sense of how she gets to these, to these root uh, descriptions. So she, she starts with what facts of reality give rise to the need for values. She doesn't just start by who should benefit from someone's actions or what problem are we trying to solve? To her, that would be uh, incorrect. It would be like you're, you're not observing the world, looking into the facts of the world, and then trying to reach your conclusions from that. So she starts off with observing facts in the world like, hey, there's living things and there's inanimate things. And living things face the conditionality of life. Inanimate things don't. So living things are then seen to, they pursue things that are needed to sustain their lives. So, and, and pursue means slightly different things depending on the context. So for a plant, the, the values are things like water and sunlight, perhaps. For an animal, the, the values are slightly uh, higher level. And for humans, of course, they're even higher level than, than animals. But the, point, the basic point is that there are some things without which human beings stop living. They basically go from being living to inanimate. If, the, if those things are unfulfilled. And that's what she calls values. She defines them as a value is that which one keeps, one acts to gain or to keep. That's, uh, that she gets that from this inductive process of looking at animate uh, li living things across the board. And so this is how, as fundamental as it gets because plants have values, animals have values, humans have values. This is not starting philosophizing at some level of of economics, but, but it's getting down to existence uh, ty type of things, observing existence. And since, since uh, many of people in your audience are Austrians, I'm going to get into a, a Crusoe example because that's a very familiar one to, to most people in this audience. So uh, imagine Crusoe on the island, 
um, he faces the conditionality of life. So I'm trying to concretize what I just said that yep. was more theoretical. Crusoe faces the conditionality of life. He needs certain things. You know, he needs to catch fish, perhaps. He needs, a, he needs coconuts. Um, he needs to start a fire so he can cook the fish because he realizes that, hey, eating raw fish is uh, not particularly good, whatever it is. But he must first use his mind to, to identify them as values. So there's a cognitive part of it. And then he has to produce them. And even in producing them, he has to identify th there's a cognitive part of knowing what the means are uh, of how he has to, what, what actions he has to take. So this cognition involved through the whole process. But here's the key part, and that is, th in some, in some uh, bigger sense, there might be a certain limited number of or finite number of fish in the lagoon. But the values that Crusoe is looking for uh, those are the ones that are scarce. It's the caught fish. It's the plucked coconut. It's it's the 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 so to, to think of this in terms of materials is actually an error. The the scarcity is that of values that man has to produce. Now I'm going to add one more layer to this. Let's say Friday comes along, but here's the twist. Friday is an indestructible, immortal robot, which Stefan you may recognize is a, is an is an Iron Rand. Um, Method that she he used to make certain certain points in her in her objectivist. Ethics. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's flawed. Like the evenly rotating economy is flawed because there cannot be an indestructible robot. And you, you could no, but know, I, I'm, I'm, you could I'm using, know that he was indestructible. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely familiar with all this. And I'm using it only yeah, yeah, only yeah. to make a point. I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not suggesting that men are indestructible robots. I know, what, but that, what that's saying, why we it, use the evenly rotating economies to make a point to isolate something. But the, the, think, so for Friday this, yeah. being this indestructible person is he doesn't face the conditionality of life that Crusoe does. So he, 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 the same materials exist for him, but there are no values in, in his life because he doesn't need anything. Not yep. facing. So the, this is a way to illustrate a simple point. Nothing more. Nothing less. I, I know. But by, by the way, I'm just, I know. I, 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 I've written on this. I disagree with that example, by the way. But go, I know that's what she's trying to illustrate. I think the example fails. But she, she is using that that for some other purposes. I brought this into the Crusoe example to make a different point, which is mm -hmm. it, it illustrates the that if Crusoe's life was not conditional, then there would be no such thing as values. He would not have to think. He would not have to create a, a cognitively identify them and then figure out how to produce them and that is the the main point in this and there are other so so this is um, if if we get to to the point where we we understand that if we didn't if the, if life wasn't conditional there'd be no values so you you start to realize that that there's something something odd about the scarcity of materials it it hasn't gotten to the point of um of man's interaction with that to, to make them into values. And those are the things that are scarce. So if we talk about scarcity without getting to values, we're actually missing the point. And we are, we're, making, we're making a fundamental approximation, which we might think is good, but we're missing something a little more fundamental. And that can lead us to some significant errors. There are other examples of this, which we can, we can talk about uh, oil that was that was uh, in in, a, in Pennsylvania in the in, in the night. It was there for centuries, just bubbling out of the ground or whatever it was. It wasn't. It was a material, but it wasn't a value. And well, fact, or or as or as, ran, or as a, uh, economists would say, it wasn't a good yet. It was even a bad, maybe. But yeah, I, it, this it, concept it, is not that new to Rand. But I don't I'm disagree not, with not, it. But, I'm trying yeah. to make a point, uh, a logical chain that. Perhaps your your audience will see is right. Is, go ahead. Go ahead. That, yeah. So. Uh, by the way, I'm familiar with all this, and I agree with most of it, except for some of the terms. Okay. Like you could define scarcity the way you're using it in values, but go ahead. Keep going. All right. So um, the the oil example is interesting because there too it was it might even have been uh, finite in some sense of you know how many million barrels of oil there are or something like that, but it is not a value until man using his cognitive fac faculties makes it a value. And that's a big part. So th there's an intellectual component to that. And then it has to be uh, converted into something. It has to be used in something. So all that, that entire chain. 
so so the focus on materials is is superficial that that's the point so scarcity of materials even means if you say means without means to what end the end is is what matters and that's where the values come in so that's true but but we're not ghosts you recognize that and Rand even no said doubt. that we're not ghosts we're, we're not material just, material things actually do matter and i'm going to talk mainly about material things you'll notice my examples are material but mm -hmm. The, the, and I'll make, I'll make this point a little more cohesively in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So I'm on, with you on that. We, we are not ghosts. Man is a unity of mind and body. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that the, the focus on body alone is actually superficial, which I would suggest the uh, Rothbardians tend to do, focusing a little more on, on the body and to the, to ex the exclusion of the mind. And in doing so, they miss, they miss some critical... Uh, process, but let's let's carry on. So the the value is not the scarce material; it is the value that it represents to the rational mind of the person who produces it in their life for their life. So I, I, from there, I, I want to get into property because that's what we are really after. Our discussion is setting the stage for for what is the root of property. But the the key takeaway from that the examples given, and we can have other examples as well, which I'll be happy to bring up later on. But man must first conceive of the values that are necessary to maintain his life. He doesn't find them in nature. So there's a cognitive part of identifying the values. Then there's additional mental processes where he must identify the means by which these values are created or obtained. And then he must act. So the physical part is, is built in. So I'm not ignoring, this is not, the man is a ghost idea. There's, there's all of these processes, but to ignore the intellectual, the cognitive, the conceptual is, is, a, is, is, to, is to be superficial. So the unity of mind and body, it, it, it means that, it, it, that the creation of values are what sustains his life. It's not just the body. So Rand has a very interesting quote, which I'll, be, I'll, I'll take a minute to read. The action required to sustain human life is primarily intellectual. Everything man needs has to be discovered by his mind and produced by his effort. Again, mind and effort, mind and body. Production is the application of reason to the problem of survival. So this is kind of the bigger picture that, that captures both cognitive and the action part of it. So the big conclusion, the radical conclusion that Rand reached in this process is all property is fundamentally intellectual property. So, so that's the, the, the main aspect of, of this is that, that you, you, it's not as though there's um, this property that does not have some component of conceptualizing. There may be less or more. And I'll read you one, one, one more quote from Rand, which is re very relevant. Uh, it's actually from, from her 1964 essay on patents and copyrights, which I'm sure you've read. It says, Every type of productive work involves a combination of mental and physical effort, of thought and of physical action to translate that thought into a material form. The proportion of these two elements varies in different types of work. At the lowest end of the scale, the mental effort required to perform unskilled manual labor is minimal. At the other end, and this is what the patent and copyright laws acknowledge, is the paramount role of mental effort in the production of material values, an end quote. So property rights actually secure the values, the material values that are born of the human mind. That's the, the root of property. And I haven't got to property rights yet. Uh, so we, we just talked about where property begins. And that's the, the, the if you give me a couple more minutes, I want to connect them to property Go ahead. rights. Good, take your time. Thank you. And, and then, uh, uh, then we'll talk about intellectual property. That, that's, those are my two and, and, other... And, and, and by the way, I am intimately familiar with all this, of, of course, and I understand it, and there's a root of grain of truth in it. But there's, there's probably lots of people that are listening and that, or that have listened to Austrian and libertarian stuff. They've never, they've never read a lot. They don't even understand the Randian approach. Like I think you need to understand the Randian approach and appreciate it and to see – well, in my view, where she goes astray, but um, this is probably helpful to set the framework for where you're coming from. So go ahead. 
Thank you. And I, I think that's, so if people haven't heard this, then, then at least they'll understand that the, the approach here builds from fundamentals. It, it, is, it is probably more convenient you know, to think in terms of scarcity because those are easier concepts rather than thinking in terms of value and, and the cognitive component and the physical component. But superficial does not mean that it's correct. It, might, it means that you might be missing something important and you, you might reach wrong, wrong conclusions. It is easily, it's possible to reach a wrong conclusion. To it's, totally agree with that. Totally okay. agree. Although, so, although I would, what I would say is probably what's going on is that a deeper understanding of all these interconnections can help you clarify, hone, and deepen your understanding, um, if nothing else. Like, there, like there's no downside to it. But, but go ahead. Yes, and also be because people like you are thought leaders in this, in this area, uh, it, you are certainly familiar with this, and you're, you're able to delve at, the, at this level in, into the detail of it. So, yes, it, it, it may be easier to, to explain scarcity, but you, you're able to go to the, to the root of the, prop, of, the, of the description that means we should be able to get it right and then explain it to, to, to others. That's all I'm saying here. And I think, I think Rand does that, and this is where maybe you and I disagree. So let's, if you, I've got two more main points to make. Go ahead. I'm going to get into property rights and then how it applies to IP. So Go ahead. Um, we'll start with a, with a, I'll throw in a couple of definitions because otherwise if I don't define my terms, then I'm not doing my job in, in this discussion. So let me, let me talk about that. So actually one step before I define rights. So there's nothing inherent, rights are not inherent in humans. There's no intrinsic thing that we can point to, oh, there's a right, or there's a, there's a right out there in, in nature that I can, that I can point to. Uh, they're not objects in the world. They're a, they're a conceptual thing. So Rand's definition is that rights are a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. So the point there is that there's a sphere of action and in this sphere, you, you cannot be coerced. And we are, it's, we are formulating this as a principle. So uh, a right to property is that I have a liberty to use this property to the benefit of my life. And it's an it's a area that you're, you're calling a, a sphere of action. That's what a right is, but it's important to note there's nothing, there's nothing intrinsic about a right. That's, that's, a, that's a key point. And let's also say, what is exactly is property? I talked about values. I'm going to talk about property now. Property is, this is the simplest definition that, that I can think of, any material value that is created and used by someone. So that's, that's as basic as it gets. So Crusoe, for example, on, on the island, uh, he has property. Once, if, if he catches a fish, it's it's his property. Now, the concept of property. By, by the rights, way, by the way, by the, I totally disagree. But you can keep going. Okay. And you haven't defined what you keep adding the word material to value. Earlier, you said value is like a subjective thing, like it's something you act to gain or gain and or keep. But now you're adding material, even though you rejected materiality and physicality. And I don't agree that Crusoe has any property rights whatsoever if he's living on an island. But, I, I but haven't said but, that. I haven't said he has any property rights. The concept of property exists even without a social context. Remember, rights, right? rights are and a moral I, that's principle. What, that's, what, that's what I'm disagreeing with. But, but, yeah, but so, go ahead. Well, I, I'm not saying that Crusoe has property rights when he's by himself. Well, then what's, what's property if it's not a right then? That, that, the point is the 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 material value that is created and used by someone is property. Yeah, but what does material add to your, your – you keep saying value. Why, it, why do you say material in front of it? There are things in the world. It's that simple. The, the things in the world that, cru, that whether you have it, I have it, Crusoe has it. Those, so you, so, you, so you do have a physicalist view of some, some things. Oh, yes. Everything I'm talking about is, is, is a material value in the, in the world. It's not – it's not some ideation. So, uh, you know, I'm not talking about, and I'll get to that when I, when I get to property, uh, to intellectual property. This is not some, some th there's a mental component, but it's, there's a material value in the world, and we're only talking okay, so about that. Okay, so just clarification. So, like, the novel Atlas Shrugged, the pattern of that novel that defines what that novel is, is that a material value or not? 
I, I'll get to that in, in a bit. There, okay. There is, okay. There, there is a material value there, but I haven't got to that yet. And okay, I think we'll ahead. get out of sequence right, in, in the ahead. description there. Go ahead. So, I'm, de I'm derailing. Go ahead. No, you're not. But I'm, I'm just saying that it will, it will be confusing to anyone who is listening to this if we, if we get off topic uh, on, and miss certain key, key aspects of it. So um, we talked about property as, as any material value that is created and used by someone. So Crusoe has some, a concept of property, perhaps, but not property rights, because, as I said, rights are, exist in a, social, in a social context. So when Friday shows up, that's when uh, a, a, the social context might exist, if they are, if they are thinking along those lines, and they, they might uh, be able to conceptualize the, the concept of, uh, of property rights. But that's a key part of it. So, Property represents, this will sort of get to this, your question about the material aspect of it. Property represents the values that are conceived and then created in the material world by individuals. So you conceive the value and then you create it. So land, for example, by itself, fallow land is not property until you do something to it. You, you convert it into a value. So the, the value represented in the use of the land not the land itself, because otherwise, in fact, this will apply to some of your concepts about homesteading and so on. It's the, it's the use of the material that what we are talking about. That's why it's, it's important to, to know that. And then once again, the type of the value gives it, gives it context. So for example, uh, a wild animal, when does a wild animal become value? Well, you can't just point to a deer out there and say, hey, that's mine. You, you have to lay your hands on it, perhaps. So some, there's, a, there's a concept of it becomes a value. So there's a, each, each material that you think about becomes a value when you have converted it into a material value. Until then, it's just a, it's just a thing and then you, or a material which you, you have to convert it into a value. So the, the source of all property, actually, is value-creating productivity. It's not... It's not labor, it's not scarcity, but value producing, value creating productivity that Crusoe or you or I have to do in order to uh, turn a material into a, into a value. And that's why we're talking about, uh, about the material aspect of it. So now we get to property rights. But we define property, and so the definition of property rights is, is sort of similar. It, it, it borrows from it, it says, the right to acquire, use, and dispose of those material values. It's that, it's that simple. There's nothing more, nothing less. So we, we said a property is a, any material value that is created and used by someone, and a property right is the right to acquire, use, and dispose of those material values. So that's, that's about the, the most fundamental level of understanding property and property rights. So what property rights do is they secure, under the law, a domain of freedom for an individual to create the values and then use them to, to live their life. That's, that's it. It's, it's that simple in, in, in conceptual terms and that fundamental. So, um, and then as I mentioned, since property itself is contextual, like it, a certain type of context applies to land, a different context applies to animals, a different context applies to a stream of water. So property rights are also contextual. And if you understand the context of the value, then the property rights will follow that. And this is a key, key part of, of uh, what comes next, which is we're going to apply it to intellectual property. And then I'll be glad to uh, ha hand it back to you. So I'm now going to talk about the intellectual property. So we know that the very use of the word intellectual and property, we're kind of doing the, the genus differentia thing, where the genus is property and the differentia is intellectual. So there, there is, there is uh, something special about it. Uh, it's, not, it it's, it's a kind of property, and that's what we're trying to, to define by, this, by the term intellectual property. But I'll begin by saying that intellectual property rights are not about protecting ideas. We, we use this in the loose, you know, colloquial uh, context of, oh yeah, we're protecting ideas. 
But actually, that's not the case. It's about the right of exclusive control of material values in the real world. The ideas may have led to that. As I said, all, all values come from some cognitive process. But we're not protecting the idea. If I said we were, then just by reading a patent, you'd be infringing on it because you know, your mind is engaged with that. And if that is, is illegal, well, th there goes uh, the whole, the whole well, match. Well, just a brief interjection. I mean, some of your compatriots will say that there are rights to ideas. I don't, and, I, I, and, and Rand never says that. So I, I would say that there are many incorrect interpretations. Um, and I would say if you, if you follow a, a, the right method and the right interpretation, you'll arrive at, at what right. I think is the, is the right approach. So Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so as I said, it's about the right of exclusive control of material values in the real world. <sighs> but there, right. is, there is a key difference between the nature of values secured by intellectual property rights and the value secured by property rights in tangible goods like land or an automobile. So there's a context. Remember, we talked about a different context. So now I'm going to get to, the, to why the, there, there's a different context. And that's why there are differences in intellectual property rights and, than and, and tangible property. You know, you'll, you'll bring up the case of why are there time limits, etc. And But there, there are they follow the same genus, which is property, but there are differences. I would I would be acknowledged. Well, I'll, the I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the fact that, I mean, you need to define what you mean by property and intellectual property in the first place. I mean, I, well. Yes, I'm, and I'm about, I've, I've defined property, I've defined property rights. I'm about to, def, to define intellectual properties. So broadly speaking, again, this is coming from the, the two different the two different types of material values. It's, it's best understood by example, but while I'm, while I'm going through the example, keep in mind that value is that which one acts to gain or, uh, and keep. So keep, keep both those things in mind. There's the gaining and the keeping that are involved in, in value. I, so, I, I, I will, but, but so far I noticed that like, you keep saying material value, but I've asked you to define material value and I still am not sure what I'm but material value is, is, th is things in the world, and I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes, actually, in, okay. uh, in, by example, how intellectual property is also about controlling material values, and it's okay. not about ideas. That, that's my. Sort I mean, of, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to ultimately ask you to defend what type of law you just you think is defensible, like, like, not just these general terms, which is fine, but like. How does this boil down to you defending a particular type of law that is enforced by physical force, right? If Patent, you ask, copyright, ask trademark, trade secret, whatever. Like you have to, you have to translate this into what your what policy you're opposing or favoring. It's a fair question. If you don't mind, ask me that in in about three minutes sure. or two Go minutes. Ahead. So that, sure. because I, 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 I have to get to a certain point of, of yep. what what material values are in terms of intellectual property and since you've asked that question i really want to address that before we get into the topic of uh, you know enforcement and law and things like that so i'm going to show this by by an example so let's say that a mutual friend of ours um, let's say his name is john galt uh, he invents a, a, a car that runs on heavy water or distilled water or something. Okay, let's say he calls it an H2O car. So okay. by inventing the H2O car, he has used mental and physical effort to create a material value in the real world, which is the value that of, of reproducing the car is a material value. It is, it is not an idea, it is the, the value of reproducing the car itself is a material value. Rand calls this dynamic value because uh. each, each, time, each time a car is created, new value is created. It's not a static value, it's a dynamic value <laughs> in the yeah. sense that, but it is a material value. Yeah, material that's the value. argument against IP, but go ahead. I mean, yeah, so, that's, the, that's the idea that people can copy ideas that are useful and use them in their own actions. Yeah, I agree with you so far, but so that's an you, argument against IP. 
I'll, I'll, I'll let you make that case, uh, but yeah. if, if, yeah, I may, if I may, go ahead. I may go continue. Ahead. So the, the value, in the material value in, in IP is actually the reproduction part of it. It's the re reproducing is the material value. These are things in the world that come into being because the originator, uh, the inventor, John Galt in this case, put in the mental and, and physical uh, effort to, to make this available. And he then is, uh, because he's the first guy to have done it, he, he's basically- uh, wait, gets, wait, 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 wait. How do you know he's the first guy? You just uh, assume I, that. This is, this is an example. I said, he invents. I said, John Galt has invented an H2O car. So, so let's- so well, that, well, hold on. Uh, uh, not to be nitpicky, but that doesn't mean he's the first. Well, let's, I know, let's say he is the first. I mean, this, to me, it's a, it's a distraction to say, is he the first or is he not the first? I, I'm making, uh, uh, in, in the example, that John Galt has invented this thing which has not existed until he invented it. It is a fact that these, such inventions exist. So I'm not going too far afield by saying, let's start with the assumption that he has invented it. It's, my, it's an I example. I mean, there could, there could have been a guy 10 years ago on another continent who came up with it, but then it faded away. I mean, He's not necessarily the first. That's all. That's all I'm saying is, if you're going to hinge something on the fact that he's first, how do you know that? Well, and why is that relevant? Why is it relevant that he's first? Why is it relevant that uh, the first homesteader has the value? So the, the point there is, if you apply it to that, it's it's the same. Uh, it's the same conceptual approach that that the first, however you define it, first to file, first to invent. Those are those are again, terms that come from legal philosophy, not even political philosophy. And they are aspects that we, we will have to get to in the inductive process of figuring all that out. So I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't do that. I'm saying when we're talking about a philosophical argument, let's focus on the fact that things do get invented. There can be someone, however you define it, is the first, and he, he invents the H2O car. Well, so, well, well, hold on a second. I mean, uh... Not to derail you, but I mean, you can see that innovation is a cumulative process, I assume. Incremental, everyone builds upon previous concepts, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you, usually when a new invention comes about, like the light bulb or something like that, it, it comes when its time has come. It doesn't come because there was an Edison. Like well, in other words, there are many people trying to do the airplane or the light bulb or whatever at the same time, and they will eventually it will come about because the technology has come to the point where this will happen, and it could not have happened without the precursor inventions. So everything if, is everything is if, incremental and cumulative. And if it agree? does, and, and and if if it relies on previous inventions, those everything those... everything rely no. But this is my point: it's impossible not to rely upon previous inventions. Fair enough. And this nothing comes nothing comes uh, ex nihilo, right? From nothing, everything we, comes from a context. And we will get you, your question. Your question is basically leading us into the discussion of why should there be time limits, and we'll get to that. Um, no, but, my question is not time limits. Where should, where should there be property rights at all in coming up with a new recipe or way of organizing the matter that you have under under your disposal? This that you. Well, uh, but go ahead. So, so the, the fact is that uh, John Galt has invented this H2O car, and before that, now the antecedent events, whatever they are, let's say, let's say he has to use knowledge from from before. And if, no, he, but 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 hold, on. he does have to. I think you can see that, right? Absolutely. There's no, I, there's no way he's gonna wake up as a baby and do this. He has to build not, upon knowledge. I'm right? not suggesting that, but. Prior to John Galt, there was no H2O car, and now there is. Okay. Well, there was an H2O car step minus one, right? Whatever that was. I mean, there was something before. And Every, if, everything and, is incremental. And, and that too, if it was a material value that existed in the world, oh, that was, then, then John Galt would, would probably license it from them. So th th those are, I think, details that we need to <laughs> get into. But you, the, the, we're talking about a, a concept here where an inventor, what is the value that he has? That wait a minute. So wait, wait, wait. So, but, you, but notice what you just said. He's going to license it from them. So like you're envisioning the society where this guy's got to 
just to exist in the world and to imbibe the technological concepts that have existed for millennia, he's got to run around negotiating licenses first. Seriously, not at all. Not at all. He might he might learn from a physics teacher, for example. Well, that, isn't that, that violating someone's goddamn IP rights? I mean, come on. Not necessarily. We'll we'll get to that. You see, th these are all important but derivative points. And, and if, we, if you're trying to get to the concept of when when someone invents something, is there a material value that did not exist before? And whether he owns all of it or some of it, we can talk about that and, and how much of that is owed to previous. We, we can assign all of that. And that's what this discussion can be about. But ahead, ultimately, there is a material value that, that the H2O car represents. And it, it's, it's sort of like, like a farmer turning fallow land into, into a farm. It's sort of analogous to that. Now, let's well, say, it's it's analogous, but analogies don't make arguments because I'm not. Can, I'm, not you, I'm just. I'm trying to cement the idea and, and try to connect it to something that is familiar to people, so that they can say, "Oh, this is not some something that's weird and radical. It is at least at least conceptually familiar to us." So let's. Well, well, not, hold, well hold on, hold on a sec. But that, that's all fine. But let's be clear. This is not something you have. You you don't have an uphill burden here. You don't have to prove to people, hey, I'm trying to introduce this crazy idea of IP to you. We live in a world in, embedded in this idea. I mean, they already accept what you're talking about. So, Well, but the point is that you're opposing even the fact that an invention uh, can, can exist. And I'm saying an invention. So I'm starting my example with an invention. So if you don't mind, let me just go through this, and then we can... We can get into other things. You know, feel free to ask whatever you, you want to ask about it. So uh, what I'm saying is that there is this is a dynamic value that John Galt has, has in that the value is represented by the by the materials that he, he material value because he can reproduce it. It's actually that reproduction of that which is a value that is protected uh, that that is considered intellectual property now. The, let's say now let's com contrast this with the other kind of property that that is more familiar to people. So let's say um, let's say a Marxist, someone like let's say Bernie Sanders, comes along and buys one of John Galt's H2O cars. Okay, now that's a property that people actually understand. So let's say he buys a car. The entire material value is present at the time that the car was created, and then he bought it. So. This is why it's called, it's a static value. So there's, there's a two different kinds of, of value. Things, that, we, things that, that you buy from someone, like a, which, which we all think are co covered by property rights, those are static values. So Bernie did not create the H2O car, but here's what he needs to do. He needs to act to keep it, to maintain it. So he has to you know, change the flux capacitor every so often, or whatever he has to do in order to maintain it. So there's a kind of a, a burden on Bernie Sanders to, to do that. Now, Bernie Sanders, being who he is, will probably advocate for uh, you know, high taxes and basically tax himself out of existence. But that's a separate point. That's part of maintaining your property is to also not, not attack the concept of property rights. So, but as long as that's going on, he gets to keep his, his, his property. So the, the point is that there are two different kinds of, of property, and the contexts are different. So intellectual property is actually that the, the material value in, in, is, is the patent is just a piece of paper. It's nothing more than, than a piece of paper. But what it, what it secures is the material value of, of reproducing the mousetrap or the H2O car. Yeah, yeah, that, but, that, but okay, that's fine. It is, but there's, no, there's nothing, there's not an idea. It's not some, some thing in, in someone's an, head. Okay, so... so the material value of reproducing something, what that means is you have the legal right to stop someone from making a use of their own property without permission. That's what you mean. And we'll, That's we'll what get, it comes down to. We'll, we'll, so you we'll have get to that because, well, because ultimately you're talking about uh, – yes, so, uh, so we, we are, we're getting to the, to the root of it, which is if it is a material property of material value, then – it, it, so you can disagree with that, but if, if it is a material value, then 
you, you have to, the burden of proof is to show on why is it why is it so different from uh, something no, else if you no, can protect no, I one I disagree the burden of proof is not to show why it's different the burden of proof is to show why your use of force is justified that's the yes. ultimate burden of proof well because we're so, talking ultimately about what laws are justified correct wouldn't you agree with that not what necessarily. laws are justified I, I, i'm i'm getting to the moral concept we yeah, haven't but, got to law but, but yet. laws are based upon morals right so the quest the ultimate question is which laws and legal system do you think is justified or not that's the ultimate question here which is I, why it redounds to a question about material values because laws only affect material things and you know why because laws are only enforced by physical force applied by government goons and courts against physical property so it's always a question about who owns which material resource even though you want to say it's not it's a i mean you want to change the definition talk about material values and blah 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 it's all the the legal question is always a question of which law is justified so that's our dispute here so which law like if you're if you're saying i'm wrong and saying IP law should be abolished. You're saying there should be an IP law. So you're saying there should be a law. But what I'm but, saying is that I, I, IP is moral. And so if, if it's moral, then we can talk. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Yeah, we but, can but, talk but, about. So no, the, no, no. The, hold, hold on a second. Hold on. Let, let me back up a second because I, I think we're getting a little bit. I've given you enough on this stuff, I think. I mean, you could say it's immoral to. You know, watch pornography all day long. But I assume, as a Randian, you wouldn't say that there should be a law outlawing pornography. Correct? I'm I'm not at all talking about outlawing no, 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 things no, no. like that. Give Give me a second. Just give me Give me a little leeway here, Your Honor. I mean, you would say that uh, uh, you know, uh, being indolent, or there's lots of things that you shouldn't do morally that we all can agree to. You shouldn't be dishonest. You shouldn't be, shouldn't be lazy. You shouldn't be indolent. You shouldn't be uh, a cad. But you shouldn't do drugs. Maybe you shouldn't be a, a cocaine addict, right? But I assume you're against the drug war. Right? Yes. You don't I think am. that the government has the right to make it illegal to take to buy cocaine or marijuana. Right? I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that, that there is no okay. justification for that. So the moral and the legal are not the same realm of analysis. No, but he, but he, the point is, is not that so when we're talking about is something is a material value. Oh, okay. Well, you, I, I, what I, is that? What I, does that mean? I mean, you keep you, you I just, I just, define what you mean by material value. Yet. What does I that just, mean? Something the, is a material value. It's a thing in the world you mean, that a man. You mean the right to get profit, which no, is again, less I no, said earlier, I'm, the Marxian. I, I, I'm not making that point. So please don't put words in my mouth. I'm not talking about profit. I'm I'm saying specifically that John Gold has created a material value, which no, is no, he hasn't. He hasn't created a material value. He's cre he has come up with a way to organize his material matter that better serves him. And he can uh, maybe sell instances of it, but he hasn't created a material value. That's just a conceptual way of formatting it that no, lets the, the, you the smuggle material, in. The material value is in that the, the reproducing part of it. So when, when you talk on, in some of your lectures that the Internet is a giant copying machine or something like that, yep, therefore, yep, yep. so, so I, I'm actually going exactly to, to that point is that okay. it, it, the material value that John Gold has because it didn't exist before it before he he invented this so he he did something a combination of mental and physical actions and I as a result yeah. as a result of that th there is this this uh, thing that he he is able to reproduce and he's now able to to make as many copies of that as he wants to make wait wait hold on hold on hold on everyone else is able to make copies too that's that's exactly the point is that who should because it's a, if it's a material value, then if the, what's a, wait wait if what's a material value the 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 reproduction of that is the material the, right, value. the reproduction right. Well, we are talking first about the value from from the value because as I said earlier, there's a, there's a there's a hierarchy here. You start with the value, which establishes the context. From there, you get to 
is, is it's a property, if it's a material value that has been created by man for his use in his life, then it's a material value. I mean, but you haven't defined what. Pro so, what does property mean for you? I just defined it in in the in a few minutes ago, but I'll I'll, I'll happily re restate it. So, yeah. a property is any material value that's created and used by someone. Yeah, but property. You told me earlier, property is a normative concept, right? So, like, it's what the law should protect with yes. the use of physical force correct no, this is physical material force we're still talking moral morality here the no, normative is morality well if, if you're if you're telling me that it's immoral for me to copy someone to, to okay if someone comes up with like let, 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 let's give a concrete example there's a taxi cab monopoly which sucks and this guy uh uh comes up with uber so Uber now is a new way of doing ride sharing, which undermines the taxi cab monopoly. So if you're saying it's immoral for me to take that I, that that concept, that material value, whatever you want to call it, and do Lyft as a competitor, if you think it's immoral to compete, I disagree with you. But even if it's immoral to compete, it shouldn't be illegal. So the specifics of, of we can get into some cases. I, I don't want I don't know the complexities of what is protected uh so so there's a whole aspect of legal philosophy that should look at the at what is moral and then induce from that what is what is what is protectable what should yeah, be secured yeah, okay that's fine but 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 you keep evading the the final point is ultimately what we agree is so so let's let's see what we agree on do you agree <laughs> That there can be – I mean there's all these reasons you gave, which by the way I largely agree with, intellectual combined with physical everything, the unity of the mind and spirit. Body. I can own a home. I can own a car. I can own a factory. I can own my body. You agree with all that, I assume. You think that the law should protect property rights in physical property that people acquire by – homesteading or by contract do you agree with that or not so i agree that and i would i would actually add to what you said and say <laughs> even even those even those concepts of property are have an intellectual a significant intellectual part of it and so i don't i don't disagree by the way i okay. never said they didn't i'm so, just saying so, what we agree with what we what we agree on do you so, agree with that that someone I can do. own a home I, I i totally agree with that i i i i would say i would even look at it from a more fundamental level and under, once you understand that there's an intellectual component in that as well same with the the, the intellectual component that that about reproducing it is also an intellectual thing. It's more intellectual and less physical, but it's still about the things in the world. It's, it's about how many of these things okay. can I make. So it's not by any means different. It's, it's, it, it's, con it's conceptually, it's in a continuum where it's got more intellectual okay. or less intellectual. Like, that's, what I'm, that's the point I'm making. That, that, that's fine, but... Uh... So e even a bag of corn that you harvest, there's an intellectual component that went into all of that the thinking That's the fine. planning it, yes of course of course so if you accept we're, we're, that we're, we're not we're not robots uh, i mean we're not animals but yeah we so, we don't act without intellect of course so, we know so, this so then so, so to discount the mind when you, you say we're not discounting it we're just so, counting the part that matters i mean so, no no saying, but I'm, I'm saying that you, you cannot just say a man owns his his body because a man owns his body and his mind no so, no i disagree with that you don't okay. own your mind. How do? You, how, why do you say you own your mind? Well, I mean, so, so you haven't defined the term ownership. I mean, what do you mean by ownership and property rights? We're getting we're getting off topic. No, we're not. I, this is this is the this is the topic is what the law should cover, and no, the law the, is a physical thing. The the law is what you is is you you first get your morality and your ethics right, and then you say now. Let's, well, we have a sh we, we already have a shared morality and ethics. We already agree on these things. But I'm trying to get to to a, a, a critical point of difference. But you, in, but in you our, just said you own your mind. I'm asking the, you, what does that even mean as a we, statement? That will take us in a, in a tangent. What I, I'm asking it's you. It's not a to, tangent. This to, is the root of your IP delusions. 
well, I, I, I will say you, you own the, your mind, you own the products of your mind, and all, all of that. But how can you, wait, wait, okay, so, but how can you own your mind, much less the product? What does it mean to own your mind? Tell me what that means. This is, I think, the root of our disagreement. It's, it's, it's not actually, but, but we can, we can discover that. Well, in, in, in my, in my view, it is. I mean, I, we, I disagree with you. So, I mean, how can you say what are the? I, well, I, what I'm saying, you think you, we you own disagree. our minds. I don't think we own our minds. The point of disagreement here is actually that you think that that the an inventor's um, an inventor's material value that includes. The, no, I, I, include, I, I, please, please let me finish. It includes the the making copies, the the copies of that, not making them necessary, but the 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 value represented in the reproduction. You're saying that is not something that is material value, and I'm saying no, it is. no, no. The problem is I don't I don't think this concept of material value makes any sense in the first place. That's the problem. But this that's because that's because you you hold a scarcity. Uh, view of of property, and I'm saying no, no. It's because I think Ayn Rand misidentified like value is not a noun. Okay, it's an act. It's a verb. You val you demonstrate that you value something by acting to gain and or keep it. Okay, but something is not a value. This is the fundamental problem. Ayn Rand was cr she 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 cross pollinated different categories. She's correct that, yeah, we have to have an intellectual component to action. To succeed, you have to have a mind. You have to have ideas. You have to have knowledge. You have to have creativity. But and then, that doesn't and then you have to and then you have to produce material values because no, you don't, no, you, you, don't, don't you don't you don't produce that's that's the problem. You don't produce values. So values are not produced. What you well, produce is you transform – even Ayn Rand recognized this. She said that you take input factors, which are material things, and you rearrange them. You make them into a more valuable configuration. That's not a new thing in the world. This is ontology squared. I mean this is like going crazy with ontology. You're not producing things that you own. This is like just a loose – you can't just combine these categories so willy-nilly. I mean – you tell me you disagree with me. Like I say I want to abolish patent and copyright law. Okay, so apparently you disagree with me. Yes. Does that mean that you favor patent and copyright law and that is what all IP rights are or are there more that we should have? I favor well, I, I I favor securing all material values and I recognize intellectual property as a material value. And that's actually where our our the fundamental disagreement is. So you think we should extend IP law to fashion rights and perfume rights and things that are not yet covered? I mean, is there, is there no end to your – I mean, you understand this would kill the human. If we had the Spooner, Ayn Rand, infinite copyright idea, the human race would, would literally die. You understand that? There's, there's no infinite copyright. So I, I would. I would oh push well, back well, I, I I totally disagree with you. Even no. though you're a more reasonable Randian, there are some Randians who believe in infinite perpetual copyright, and there are Lysander Spooner, J. Neil Shulman, Alexander Galambos, all these other in the guys that take Ayn Rand's idea seriously believe in infinite perpetual copyright terms. Well, Lysander Spooner, we, we would predates, we would literally predates, die. Lysander Spooner predates Ayn Rand, and anyway. Uh, the, the point is, if you read the read Rand's 64 essay on patents and copyright, it's a five-page essay, so it's not a very big essay. Yeah, yeah but, 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 the, the, but, but no, no, the okay. three and a half pages of that are about uh, term limits on yeah, copyright. Yeah, but, but, so, but so she there's, has there's no. no but my point is, my point is, if you believe it's a natural property right, then you either have to believe it lasts forever or it lasts for a temporary term. Now. I cannot believe you as an intelligent human being, having read that, think that she has a good argument for defining and circumscribing what this temporary term should be. All yes. she has is muttered phrases about, oh, well, you shouldn't be able to live forever upon your ancestors' effort. I mean it's just bullshit. It's like nothing principled whatsoever. She recognizes that if she favored a perpetual copyright term, it would kill the human race, so she opposes that, but she doesn't want to go to zero, so she's somewhere in between. That's all she knows. There is but, no but, principle. 
you missed you missed a key part of that essay, which I know you read because you referenced it in, in other things. So this is why I made the point about static values and dynamic values. So and th there's a there's a uh, the difference between the a car that Bernie Sanders bought from John Galt, that's a, that's a static value. All the value in that- Oh, for God's is, sake. Is wait, wait, wait. So, so, so your argument is that if Bernie Sanders buys a car, there's a difference between that and, and what? Please let me, I, I, didn't, I didn't complete making my point, but- Go ahead, go the, ahead. The, the difference between static value and dynamic value, which is mentioned in that essay, it's only a couple of paragraphs, but it's a very critical point that I think it's really worth thinking about, and, and you know, you're you're a brilliant person, so you 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 think about this. You you'll get this too. That that there's there are two different types of values, and each establish its own context. The car, the car is a, is a, all of the all of its value is represented at the the time it no, is no, created. No. Hold on, hold on. The car doesn't I, have I, a value. I, we 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 both agree, nothing has intrinsic value, right? So you can't say no, all of its all of its value. Nothing has a value. Nothing all, has a value. So let's say Bernie Sanders values transportation, and he okay. buys he buys a car, and he says so. Well, all he that, does. Well, hold on. A gain there. He doesn't value the car just for transportation. Whatever it is, he, he, he might have a, a, a he might have ten thousand different reasons so, why he so values the car. The, but all of those exist at the time. That, Nothing. They they don't exist. No. Okay, the, but, but, the, the the value represented. To Bernie Sanders again, value always requires a valuer. This is a there is no value. You're thinking you're, you're an intrinsicist, basically. No, no, no not there at is, all. There is there is no value. The there value is no value. The value is a conceptual thing which Bernie Sanders has. He says it explains why he does something. That's all. It's the Austrian concept of subjective value preference. It demonstrated preference. People value something, therefore they act. To, as Rand would say, to gain and or to keep it, but it does. It is not of value. You, this is you, the problem with you have Randians. To, you have to let me finish my my, yeah. my 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 point there. And well, I don't know. You've you've been going on along. I can I can interject a little bit, right? No, no, please please interject. But when you ask something, then at least let me finish the train of thought, and then go then ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So so the the, and I I, I don't buy into this the the, the Austrian concept of value in that sense, but the, the value that Bernie Sanders, the valuer, has has some notion that of what he, and all of that exists at the, because he, he's getting all that at, in one shot. There's no, there's no, uh, and, and that value, all he, all he has to do is maintain it. He doesn't have to create that. I, I, the, well, the, I thought it, things are dynamic, they're not static, so no, no, maintain but, what? There's no value. To, it doesn't he to, exist. He has to change the sure. oil. He has to do whatever. He has to. He has to do. Oh yeah, he has to. Yeah, I agree. He has to maintain the object he owns. I agree. Exactly, and this would apply to a house. It would apply. Those are tangible things. So those are the, those are static values. But it's so, not a value. It's a car. But it is. It is a, a, a the value of transportation, or he wants to use it no, as a taxi he, cab. He values whatever. it. It's not of value. This is the problem with Rand. You think of it as a noun. Again, you. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to win you over by semantics. But do you understand what I'm saying? Because you keep saying it's it's of value, like you're using it as a noun. It is not of value. It is a thing. It's a material so, object in the world that he has a property right in. Yes, it's so, not of value. He might value it, but it is not of value. You keep saying it's of value because you want to reverse engineer a property right onto on top of it, but it's not of value. The the point is that it is. So I I think you're you're missing the the the, the inductive process I walked through, but that that's okay. It's your it's your prerogative to to do that. I, I'm what I'm saying is that the the, the, there are two types of things going on here because we we started this about why is there a time limit and now we got a little bit off topic. What I'm saying no, is that no, there, actually, actually, I didn't. Start, I don't think uh, you asked I, the question about about no, that, time that, That's your dilemma, actually, because you you favor something that's in between impossible and impossible. You know, in your view, zero I, I don't, is impossible. I don't, Infinity I don't is impossible. That. Well, because you think there has to be something in between. Too impossible 
opposites. So, but, but that that's, not where I'm, have, that's not where I'm coming from. I, my, my point is that- It doesn't matter where you're coming from. You actually have to favor a finite term limit and you have to come up with an arbitrary but, number, which is not objective, right? When you're talking, about the, when you're talking about the moral uh, principle here, then it does matter. So if you don't get this right, then the, the law is meaningless. We have to get why this- you, Why don't you tell me what you're in favor? I mean, you still haven't told me, so like, I oppose patent and copyright law. I think there are many problems with each law. Okay, the terms, the finiteness, the the definitions, the domains, the scope, uh, the constitutionality, whatever. Now you you basically oppose that in some general form. You you favor IP law. You still haven't told – all you can say is you favor property rights and material values, which I don't know what that means. So what is the – what is the statute – I assume you would – you probably don't want to agree to this, but you probably would agree we should abolish the Patent Act and the Copyright Act and replace it with an, an objectivist IP statute that more rationally embodies – the material values that we have property rights in. So my question is, what the fuck is that? So what I, what are you proposing? I'm what are here you in to, favor of? I, I'm I'm here to first address a diff, a question: Is it moral or is it not? If it is if it is Im, if it is immoral, if if IP is immoral, then I I would join you in in abolishing everything. But I I believe that IP is moral. And then we get to legal philosophy. We induce all of these. We, we can look at we can look at laws. We can look at statutes. We can induce: is this law working in the context that it was applied? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. How, but but Ayn Rand in that essay, she actually endorsed the Patent Act and the Copyright Act. So I'm asking you: do you endorse it? Do you agree uh, with her or not? Ayn Rand is not a lawyer, and neither am I. Uh, well, so, but th she should have kept her mouth shut, but she didn't. So the, do you the, agree the point, with her or not? The point is not about a particular minute fact of law. If, it's if, not minute. Said, the patent and copyright laws are extremely influential and they cause devastating damage, which you support because I don't know why you support it. it so they're the horrible. Point, they're not liberal laws. These are not property rights. So the point is, if something is moral, then you have to figure out how to how to en en encode it or whatever the word is into, into law. And if you can, you can make mistakes along the way, but you need, and those need to be fixed. It, the point first to decide if is it moral, if it's if it's immoral. Well, I mean, I mean, well, hold on a second. Would you say like, okay, pornography is immoral, therefore we need to find a way to make it illegal? I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying pornography is immoral. Well, what about the what about abusing yourself with drugs and being a drug addict? Do you think that's immoral? Uh, I, I would say that that, that it's uh, people have the right to do what they what they want. I would uh, say that they yeah, are. Yeah, but that's a le that's a legal thing. I I think okay. it's immoral to destroy your life for no reason. Okay, I, by being an addict to cocaine, it's immoral that, to like be obsessed with pornography and to like be uh, to be rude to your grandmother. Okay, all these things are immoral. But does that mean we need to turn our tasks to finding a way to make it illegal? But if something is moral, you should defend it. That's the point. You should defend it, and if it if it requires, yeah. So 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 here's my point: if intellectual property is also is, is as much about material values as tangible property, then it's deserving of the same. Uh, it needs to be secured to the same extent as physical property, and that's my my point. Is actually which which I didn't quite get to. It was sort of my the last thing I wanted to say. Is really this, and you know, then you can, you can. So, if if the root of all property is intellectual, then all rights that secure material values must be protected. And so, uh, if you the, the case, my point is that the case for IP rights are morally sound. In fact, it is the same material value oriented case for all property rights. The left has been attacking both. With but deadly effect, but they have but the, they the, li the, the libertarian attack on IP rights, supposedly to protect property rights, plays into into their hands. That's sort of my my yeah. summation. No, I I, I, now, got, I got it. But the yeah. the problem is that the left hasn't been attacking IP rights. The left is actually worse on IP rights in a way than the right. 
Kamala uh, Harris wanted to take the. She said, "We will take your patents." Um, she, she, no, no, she, that's that, that's that, that's actually not true. Tell tell well, me what you're thinking of. The, the, during the during her presidential campaign, which didn't go very far, although she is now a, a vice president, uh, she was to asked about uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. Yep. Right, and, right, right. And she said that she would quote unquote, take their patents. Well, what she meant was, so the state, the federal government grants these patent monopolies and part of that statute includes the right for the federal government to withdraw them or to grant a temporary withdrawal called or a partial withdrawal called a, a compulsory monopoly, a compulsory license, sorry. So in other words, when the state gives you the ability to use a court a court right to stop your competitors the state can step in and manipulate that this is fascism it's pure fascism so the, st the state the difference is that the state is not giving you anything no, no, no more you're, than you're, it, the, no, state, no. The, the state secures your right it does not give you no, no, anything. listen this is the randian view of things but i'm telling you the but, legal but, reality but, but calling it randian doesn't make it wrong because no, no, the, 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 I, I, the, so, so your right to your no, house, i'm not i'm not trying to say it's it's wrong because it's Randy. What I'm saying is your conception of this is not correct. The the state, without the federal government patent act, there would be no patent rights. You understand that? It's similarly, not natural... similarly with, without no, the, the no, state protecting your, your rights to that, your that, property. That's why I asked you if you're an anarchist earlier. So you're not an anarchist, so you won't understand this. But no, that's it's not similar, but that's that's beside the point. My let, point let's, is, let's have a separate discussion about the, the role of government, if you like. But... We, we, we can, but my point is that the, the Patent Act that Ayn Rand favored and that you seem to favor specifically says that the state grants these monopoly privileges, but the state can withhold them in certain cases. And that is not a taking of property rights like Ayn Rand portrayed in Atlas Shrugged because she was… You know, I, I'm not criticizing her for this. She was ignorant of the way the patent law worked. But when the state grants a compulsory license, that is not a taking. It's simply not a taking of property rights. It's simply the state slightly withdrawing a monopoly pr privilege that they granted previously. That's all it is. It's not. A, it's not a taking of property rights. But you you and keep it, you keep using the the word this this granting of monopoly. The, the fact that's, is that's what it is. But the I mean, we, we don't we don't we can get into a lot of detail. Hold here. hold on you you have to you have to understand and agree that there can be no patent law without a statute. You understand that? that I would say that 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 it has there's a securing of the property right. All property rights I, they only exist when they're secured. There's no, no. there's no pro, there's no property right intrinsic. It only comes into existence when it is secured. This applies to tangible property it applies to intellectual property so you, you can we can go into the history and say that they were monopoly grants the, no it's not just it's not just the history it's, the, it's the american the, no, system I, the american system changed it's not a, the american it's, it's the entire world it's like this is the nature of these things. if you understand the way law develops the way natural law works the way our process works you understand some things can only come about by artificial state legislation okay by the way, I've argued with some Randians on this, and they concede this point, like Murray Frank, Iron Man's lawyer. So here, I, I will con I'll tell you what I will concede, that a government, a, a, a rights-protecting government is a value in my life. That's in, fine, in, but that doesn't mean they, they need to have legislation to make ah, law. But you the can, point you is… Can still have leg you can still have <laughs> law emerge organically by natural common law principles, right? The, the, the problem is that when, when you begin with… with with scarcity, then you you have this concept that you, that you could have a right without the secure the securing of that right, and I think that's that's an error that comes from a a, a superficial view of property. The the view I presented actually gets to the root of it, and because rights don't exist, this is exactly you said I was being intrinsicist. Not at all. The the fact remains that if if, if if the right the right only exists when it is secured, we can talk about what's the best way to secure it. That's where the the laws come in and the enforcement and all that. But unless 
the unless there's something securing the the material values to individuals there is no such thing as a right so i think the anarchist libertarians they they want to have their rights but because they they don't think government is is bad in a way this is sort of like a a proxy war they, they don't like government but they want the rights and they think that they can have one without the other and my, and my point is that you, you you really can't do that so if there's right. no securing of a right it doesn't exist because there's no such there's no intrinsicist uh, view of right yeah yeah but like you said that's another that's another debate i mean uh, let, let me let me try one more thing before we oh, i think we probably have to close now we can have part two or three if you want i don't mind um you've been very uh you've been very uh surprisingly uh uh reasonable given your background okay thank you i, mean, I, I don't mean to be do a backhanded compliment i mean I, you understand i deal with lots of uh pro ip and objectivist types who are completely uh unfair are you um, familiar with the with the case that i made uh, in 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 sort of the the more the more the fundamentality of it i mean you, i know you are you're familiar with ayn rand um but I, I i think that this is a part of the of the case that is missed by a lot of people again it's it's it takes a little detailed digging to to arrive at, at the what that material value is it's 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 different but because because everything is contextual you have to understand each one existing in its context in which case both the limitations on it and the the sphere that it secures are different and that but that's true of all all I, rights I, I guess i'm not sure what's your question am i familiar with what with with the with the case that i i presented you mean just now or like other somewhere else well th through the the better part of this morning oh yeah yeah I, I, I yeah believe me yeah I, I mean i'm not to i'm not trying to insult you but I, nothing you said is new to me i mean i've heard all this and i, I appreciate 70 75 percent of it i mean it's just it's like you keep dancing around the issue like the you keep saying oh well we have to do philosophy first that's all fine but Ultimately, if you disagree with me on what the law is, and ultimately we have to have a political component to our views. May, may I suggest that that th th there are probably people who are trained in the law and objectivism, and I'll be happy to introduce you to, to a couple of people that, that you can no, 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 talk no, to. No, 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 that's not the issue. That's not that's not what I mean. Well, uh, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't I don't if I if I no, start talking you know, about I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to drop. I'm not trying to drop legal authority because I. Uh, this is actually what your side does more than more than mine. By the way, um, I'm I'm not doing that at all. And I haven't I, done I am, it. I haven't no, done you, it. No, no, you don't do it. I'm a spe I'm a, actually a patent lawyer. I, I could I could like bamboozle you with legal bullshit that you would and never I, know. I, I I'm simply saying I'm that. simply saying that if you're if you think I'm wrong saying we should abolish patent and copyright, you must think there should be an IP law, which you seem to think there is. But when you keep it. This is what I brought up in the very beginning. When you keep it general and you say, okay, I think that there should be a role for the law to support the intellectual products of the mind because they're material values that we produce, blah, blah, blah. We need them to survive, blah, blah, blah. That's all fine as a general matter, but when it comes down to concrete details like, okay, so what, what legal right system are you proposing? And if you say, well… I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a legal specialist. It's like, well, then I don't know what we're disagreeing about, and by the way… Every time I could mention a hundred different examples of things, I'm confident that you and your compatriots would agree with. Like, uh, okay, the law should not prohibit this. In this this example of the application of copyright law is outrageous. You probably would agree with me on everything there. So all that means is every time from a position of knowledge, I I point out something to you that's like an example of why these unjust laws result in unjust consequences you say i agree but 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 that's not what i favor so finally i've got to say well then what do you favor you say well i'm not a specialist so I'm like well then i don't know where disappear so well because because if, today's, if you today's just topic, favor some go ahead this topic is is a moral case for ip law and i, I ip rights and i believe yeah, i made but, but i made the moral, moral case now no well so that's why we have to so when we're talking I mean, about law is not only moral. I mean, law—you ha have to get to actually what, where you think that the use of force 
by the institution of society, whether it's a state or private, whatever, like the legal force of the institution, where that can be legitimately and justifiably used, that's the question. And Ayn Rand herself was good on this. She says, do you hear me? You cannot start the use of force against someone who hasn't used force. Ayn Rand herself said, we don't create things from nothing. We only rearrange matter. I can send you the quotes. Ayn no, Rand I, said this. No, I, I, I've heard that, and actually I think you, you misuse that because you, 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 you're conflating value creation with creating matter. There's exactly. No, no, but exactly. There's no, but the but, law only but, applies to the latter. So I agree with Rand. If you uh, want to uh, say we create that, values. That, that, not, yeah. not so at all, because material values are really what a, a, a farm is a material value. Okay, okay, but you still haven't defined material value. You keep uh, saying values, and I, I, spent, I disagree I spent, with your use of that as a noun. I spent some time uh, detailing that. Material okay, let values me ask you a are, question. What, are, what's the difference between a material value and a non-material value? Tell me what the difference is. What does the word material add? Material is, is a thing in the world. So that's that's as, as And that's the as thing that property it. rights apply to, correct? Yes. And and I'm those are the scare I, those are the scarce means of action, correct? No, I, I don't I don't I don't start from scarcity, but I'm saying that I'm uh, not starting from anywhere. I'm just making I'm just an saying, observation. I'm saying that material values are scarce, yes. But the, they, they have Scarcity is, is, a, is, in my mind, just an invalid okay, so concept. If I, have, if, if I have a shovel, is that a material value or is it a shovel? Which one is it? It is, it is a, a shovel is a material value to someone who is trying to dig, dig a hole. Okay, if so, I have an iPhone, is that a material value? Yes, it is. Okay, so you're using the word material value to refer to scarce resources that people value. I'm saying that material values are scarce because human uh, cognition itself is scarce but and it takes all of that to no no make no those hold things. on hold on hold on what, what what do you mean by the 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 assertion human cognition is scarce because i did I completely disagree with that because scarcity to me is a completely political economic concept which means that there is a resource which we can employ as a means of action over which there can be physical material violent conflict that's what i mean by scarcity it's the economic concept of rivalrousness. So I don't know what you mean by scarcity applies to human cognition or something like that. What does no, that mean? I, I just think that that scarcity is an improperly integrated way of look. There's nothing normative. So you're making actually an assumption that scarcity is, is sort of a normative baseline. No, and I never said it's normative. Uh, well, but, but Ayn Rand herself because, because, said because property wait, is, property is is a normative ethical concept. In fact, to, yes. to just complete the, the the point I wasn't able to make before, the, we, in the law we are trying to we are trying to be trying to make ethical things into our bring them into our politics. That's what politics is an application is is an attempt to apply ethics to so, a social context. So when, when but you have to get the right baseline. If scarcity is is normative in your sense. Then, then, and I then yes. Said, hold on, I never said scarcity is normative. But, but by the way, just as a background for you, I, I personally adhere to the philosophical views of the Neo Randians, Rasmussen, and Den Oil. I don't know if you read them, but in their view, the the idea behind law is what what they would call meta normative. In other words, norms. The norms, the ethical norms that apply to law and what law should exist are meta norms in the sense that we're trying to identify the principles that justify the laws. So, for example, if I say I have a property right, I don't know, in my car, it, it doesn't mean that it's moral for me to use it to, you know, not let my mother in law use it to go to the hospital or something like that like that could be immoral so there is a distinction between personal morals or put it this way if i violate someone's property rights it doesn't necessarily mean that it's immoral personally what it means is that it's it, it's it's moral for us as a society to have a law that justifies and that enforces a certain uh legal principle like, I think so that, that that is unnecessarily 
collectivist in nature. It's better to start from a, a, a more fundamental premise. So that's why I say it's it's not well, as well, though they, they do start from it. I mean, I mean, you say well, it, you haven't you haven't read it apparently. I mean, no, they I'm not, I'm not, they I haven't. Start, read they that start that from they it. start from Randian Aristotelian fundamentals. They start from whatever. I'm simply saying the the, the analysis of like, would you say that? It's always immoral to violate a right. I'm asking you that a question as a question. Is it always immoral to? I mean, yes. Like, do you, do you think of rights as a subset? Of, do you think of, of of rights as a subset of morals? I think a proper, rights a, a proper right, subset. Rights come from ethics, and it, and and if we define them correctly, then. Um, uh, you know, for example, the right to life, if you interfere with that, uh, then it is immoral. And fortunately, in, in our society, illegal as well. Okay, so, so but I'm, I'm sure we could both envision scenarios where you need to violate someone's rights, and to fail to do so would actually be immoral. Like if you're trapped in the woods, and your baby's starving, and you can break into an an empty cabin and steal a can of beans to save your baby's life. You could say that should be illegal and it's a violation of property rights, but it's not immoral to do so. Well, by, you know, I, by would, the same... I would actually point you to an interesting essay, The Ethics of Emergencies that Rand wrote. But we, we're getting no, off I, no, I, I, no I, yeah. I, I agree. I agree that people overuse this emergency thing, but I, I'm simply saying that the domain of political ethics is distinct from the domain of ethics. Um, just like, for example, you know, if you're, you know, cruel to your grandmother for no reason, that's immoral, but it's not a rights violation. Like the do, it's everything that's immoral is not illegal. All I'm saying is everything that's illegal is not necessarily immoral either. The, I'm the, saying the, they overlap, but they're not proper subsets of each other. I I think we are getting a little bit off topic here because we, we are we are, we start, we are. We, that, we that's talking. how that's how i roll well uh, and i appreciate that so <laughs> if we i'd love to actually you know meet you in, in person and have a much longer uh, discussion whenever you, you'd like to do that but the, the the point i was trying to get to is that the, the, with scarcity so so there is a kernel of truth you know there's a fact in the world as as, as Rand would say there are tangible things in the world that can't be used you know differently at the same time. You know, no man can plow, two men can't plow the same furrow and all that, that stuff. So, but this doesn't tell you anything about whether scarcity itself, this idea of rivalrous exclusive use of something, whether that should be a normative baseline for defining what counts as property. That, it, doesn't, it doesn't set that stage at all. So it, it sounds like it does, and it, it's very easy to, to accept if you don't want to think at the level of of values, so that's why it, it's very popular, and and it's a, it's a, especially if you want to be an economist, but you don't want to think about ethics, then you can just make it all about uh, oh scarcity because that's that's the way they, they would like to frame it. But it it the this is this is why the this is why the problem arises with scarcity. While it's real, you the connect making it a normative ideal, you know that that's the problem. Sorry, was I muted? I can't hear you, Stefan. I can't hear you. Nope, can't hear you yet. Nope. I can see you're saying something, but there's no audio. Nope. I think I can. Can you say something now? Uh, 
it's very poor audio quality. It's almost, nope, sorry. Okay, let's pause recording. Okay, microphone is, I told you my microphone is gonna run out of power. That just means we're having a, an interesting conversation. That I know, I have this Jabra and it's like 13 hours, but I, I didn't. I didn't charge it, so it had two hours left, and we ran out. Anyway, no sorry, problem. go so ahead. People, I forgot. People, I forgot where we were. Go ahead. So we were. I was saying that scarcity is is the, real. There, there's a there's a kernel of truth. There's a it's a fact in the world. So evading it doesn't get us anywhere. But there there are tangible things in the world that you know can't be used. Uh, you know, at the same time by different people. All that. But, well, not not only that. Th this is the core of Ayn Rand's assertions about how you can't start the, the initiation of physical violence. I mean, that's a recognition of the fact that physical violence against physical objects like people's bodies and other things makes a difference. I but mean, not, it's, the view is not from scarcity. The view is Rand's view about not using force is because it, it negates or opposes or impedes reason. It doesn't so, matter what it's from. Oh, 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 it matters. It matters a great deal. So scarcity if if you if you have if you're trying to say that scarcity is a, is a normative concept, I'm not saying that. I never said that. But what that's, saying, what, that's what I'm what saying is, is implied. what I'm saying is I'm saying Ayn Rand's non-aggression principle, which she basically endorsed, non-initiation of force principle, it's that, the which same, uh, yeah. modified uh, into non-aggression. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it's an, it, it implies the recognition of rivalrous resources and the fact of the importance and the necessity of physical violence and when it's justified and when it's not. I mean, it, no, but that's, that's a, that's a derivative concept. The, the, that's fine, but, she, the, the main, but, the but it's, point, it's unavoidable. It doesn't the, matter whether it's derivative. It's unavoidable. When, when we're talking fundamentals, it does matter. So if you, if you, if you want to discuss the NAP versus the non-initiation of force principle from which it was derived, I think, I don't know, but ultimately it comes down to, uh, Okay. Force, force is the is the opposite of reason. You, you, if you decided that you, if you're going to use force, that means reason is not an option anymore. You can't oppose force with reason. And she has a whole uh, discussion about that. So, so we have to be careful if we want to talk about. I agree that. with all that. I okay. L l l I think we should close this. But let let me just say one 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 thing, and you can you can conclude however you want. Um, I think ultimately. <sighs> I can't, you can't just say as a vague, general, abstract matter, okay, we believe in rights and rights are rights to rights and material values that your intellect creates. And that includes intellectual property rights, but I'm not a legal expert, so I don't know what I'm in favor of. I mean, look, we're, li we're li you're a libertarian to some extent in the political realm. So you favor property rights in physical resources being enforced by a physical legal system in the world. I mean, we all do. This is what we agree on, I think. Yes. So you can't just say, I mean, we don't have anything to disagree about unless you tell me what you favor or what you don't agree with. So I, I actually believe that people like you, you don't want to defend the patent and copyright system because you know it's, it's completely statist and bullshit and full of exceptions or whatever. So you don't really want to defend it, but you don't want to agree with me that it should be abolished because you're afraid to. So, so you're in between, right? So no, no, but but you, you can't. The point is, you don't defend every bad law. That, I agree. That, that, I agree. That defends tangible property either. I right? agree. I'm but, I'm simply I'm simply saying I don't know what we disagree or agree on unless you tell me. And, and that's so, my so point. like it's, so like so so I can give you two. I can give you two things. Do you agree? with me or not that the patent system and the copyright system should be abolished that's one no. way to look at it and the I, second I, question is if you I do dis I disagree with that well uh, but the other thing would be okay no you have this hypothetical ip augmented legal system in mind which you would favor instead and tell me what it is and i'll tell you what's wrong with it but i don't know what we're disagreeing on unless you specify what but legal we are, system we're talking about? We are, we are. I think we are disagreeing on the on the morality of IP, and and if we disagree on that, no, then, we're then, not. Then, we're not. We're not because I don't know what that means. I'm only disagreeing with the legal system that takes property rights away from property owners. That's all I disagree with. And, and what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that that 
intellectual property represents a, 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 a form of property. I and don't care what it represents. I'm asking. But, but what no, legal but 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 then, you but then, if you if you if you're not if you're not uh, supporting that, if you if you're saying that you're not sick, you don't want it to be secured, then you're saying you want tangible property to be secured, but intellectual property to not be secured. That's what you're no, saying. No, no, no. So, so here's what I'm saying. So, are, are you saying that or not? Are you saying are you saying that both should be secured, or are you saying that only physical, tangible property should be secured? Well. It's not that it's not that simple, but I would yeah. If you force me, I would say the latter. Yes, but but the, the reason is because I, I'm not forcing you. I'm just asking you to to say. Th but then this is our fundamental disagreement. I I think I've made a case where that both are forms of property. No, and, you haven't and, because you haven't defined what property is. Oh, I, I've defined it several times in, in, in today. I, I can we can go back and and roll roll okay. tape on. Okay, that. let me let me put it this way. I think what I try to do is I try to find what we agree on. I think you agree with me that people own their bodies. Would you agree with that? Or I, that I agree. And I, I think we, we own our life, actually. Rand's oh. uh, thing was that she, she actually had a better formulation. This body thing is, is a is I know, a but I'm, I'm trying to find something we agree on. So, like, okay. we agree that we own our bodies. And you agree that you own, like, if you have a house and land and a car and money – and gold, you own those things. Would yes, you agree with? Okay. I agree with. That. Now, and, would you? And, would you? And so, therefore, for those reasons, or partly for those reasons, you oppose laws that intrude on those rights, like taxes or the drug war or conscription. Like yes, you oppose conscription, correct? I, I do. Because it takes your body from you, even though you didn't consent to do so. It, it, it does even more than that. It actually it takes your life from you. Okay, it, that's you can it, metaphorically talk about the harms of it but but no i i'm saying take the broad take the broadest view that you can otherwise you miss certain things all of these things are are essentially uh, doing something to a person's life to say body yeah, but is, to me is, to me this is this is look literature is fine but i, I i'm not into literature but if you want to use literature to to emot emotively describe the harms that come from whatever you don't like that's fine I mean, you could say that if you enslave someone, you're stealing their time, but this is not rationally, logically, literally accurate. You're not stealing time because people don't own time. You can describe the harms of slavery by saying you're taking their life from them and your life only exists in time, blah, blah, blah. But this is not metaphorically, literally accurate. The problem with slavery is that you're committing aggression against someone's body. It's not because you're stealing their time. Well, I, I, I would say that you, when you... So this is actually we can have a whole separate discussion on on NAP versus NIFP. Which, so I, I would say that that you're actually doing a lot more than just so force is not just physical. There are all kinds of uh, force. force. Force is literally just physical. That's what force means. No, not in physics, in, in, in the in the context of morality, what we're talking about. I mean morality too. Force okay, is the then, is is the manipulation by physical force of material objects that other people well, have rights to without their consent. What else can it be? So coercion, if you want to use that word, that's the threat of force. So, so that's what I'm saying. All of those things are basically. Uh, opposed to a man's free use of his reason. And that's the most fundamental okay, way to look at a, those. That's just a way of describing the consequences of it. When, when, when we're talking about morality, Stefan, these are things that matter, the conceptual identity. I don't, I don't disagree with that. They, yeah. they do matter. But what I'm, like, if you say a, a guy rapes a girl, okay, you could describe it in 17,000 different ways. He took her autonomy. He insulted her. He ruined her future potential i mean you could do, you could describe it all kinds of ways but the ultimate insult is that he used her resource without her permission her body no, the, but the, the, that's what the law it, governs at, at the root of it he said i'm going i'm using i'm i'm basically saying your reason your your reason that allows you to make choices i'm taking that away from you no, that's not the root of it. So oh, you're that, looking, that, you're, that, you're is, looking, that is a that is a moral root of it. All everything no, it's else not, is a consequence. That's fine, but you're you're trying to go into the motivations for a crime. Like when no, I am, I, when, the, it's not the motivation. It's it's what it's what the rapist actually does. Is the rapist said in in this transaction, your reason is not applicable. Well, from the point of view of the victim, 
what the rapist does is he uses her body without her permission. That is right? true, but but okay. But so that's all that matters for law for the law. Well, but when you're talking morality, which is what we're talking today, I'm not then talking I think morality. I never. People... I don't know what it means to talk about morality with IP. Are you saying that it's immoral for me to compete with someone by copying their product? Like if, I... like, hold on. When, when iPhone, when Apple came out with the iPhone, like it was a revolutionary idea to, like, remember before that you had dumb phones and you had the BlackBerry, and then Apple said, let's have a, a touchpad which is a little computer, blah, blah, blah. And that turned into the smartphone industry, correct? Yeah. And over time, Android and other companies started competing with Apple by making similar devices. Now, I guess you could come up with an analysis that it was immoral for Motorola and Android or whatever to compete with Apple. And maybe it was. I don't think it was immoral because I'm not a moral expert. But it certainly shouldn't be illegal because competition should be legal. So that's my fundamental problem with, with you people on this issue, to be honest. Like it should are you saying that should be illegal? Because Apple came up with the first rounded corners, touchscreen, tiny smartphone computer device, and other people made something similar and competed with them. Are you saying that that is wrong? That should be illegal. Did it violate Apple's rights? That's the fundamental question. So, so let's let's abstract it because I don't know the case, <laughs> and, I, and I I don't know which. This case is the problem. Talking. You won't defend anything. Every no, every but I, I, hold on, hold on. I'll, I'll tell you what I will defend. I, I will defend that that if, if a if a patent owner, what a patent owner actually has has secured for him. Apple had a patent on the rounded corners touchscreen smartphone. Okay, let's so, so take here's, here's the thing, Stephen. The reason why why these examples will will derail it is because I don't know the case. And so I don't know if the patent was good, bad, indifferent. I'm yeah, but but let's say let's say it was good. Let's say it was a good patent. So, so let let's say you have a good. Do patent. you think it, do you think there could be a good patent on the first use of a, of a of a touch screen smartphone? I mean, I, I so, 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 this is Stefan. This is this is like saying, do you defend the one click uh, thing from Amazon? I don't. I don't. I think many of those mistakes. Are, this is are what I said in the very beginning. Every time no. I point to an example, you guys back out and you won't defend it I, i'm not backing out I, I i'm saying that that th there is a there is a material value in in the reproduction oh. of something which has met the standard now what that standard is is the job of legal philosophers and lawyers like you to okay well out. that's me that's me and my conclusion is no so the other guys by the way all the other guys are self-serving so that's fine well, I don't well, know the, who you who you're talking about. What I'm what I'm saying. Is, all my fellow patent lawyers, guess they're in favor of the patent system. Hey, it's like my 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 niece, who's a public school teacher in Louisiana. Do you think she's against the public school system? No. Guess why? I don't know. But I that that that's not a an argument that's particularly persuasive. That just because someone is either for or against their interests, I I don't know that that doesn't really matter. You, you're you're against IP, and you, somehow that's. I, I, so I, I think there's we're, we're getting to off track there. I, I, I think there's a we were actually getting to a very fundamental point which got sidetracked, which was about, about <laughs> which I sidetracked. Go ahead, say it. You no, no, say it. I'm so good about, at that. So about, Go ahead. It's about scarcity. So I was I was making a, a, a larger point. You know, in fact, scarcity comes out of this perfect competition view of e e economics, and which actually evades a lot of things like values, innovation, etc. And you, you might also know that. Scarcity was used by Marxists to actually attack the free market and property rights. Basically, they said, oh, there's a scarcity of goods, and it's, it's wrong for capitalists to hoard them, you know, stealing labor from workers. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so taking what, what we are doing, what, what people who are opposing IP are doing, and, and on the scarcity premise. Scar th then, by the way, yeah. scarcity doesn't come from this perfect competition model. No, but, no. I, I, the, yeah. the, the, what I'm saying is that that argument made by Marx, instead of challenging the basis of their argument, you're accepting scarcity-oriented well, property, the, and the, then you're trying to show them that, hey, only markets can do it, and only for physical okay, goods. Okay, so, so, so the, the basis of Marxism is this labor exploitation idea, the idea that the value of a product comes from the labor people put into it, and therefore, when the when their employer makes a profit, they must be stealing the surplus value of their labor. 
And right? we both disagree with, with that mindset. I think so. However, yeah. that logic is part of the locking idea that when you own, when you labor on something to, like intellectually to create something that's valuable, if you call it a material value, you have this right to reproduce it or exploit it, which, which is just another way of saying I have a right to use legal force to stop people from competing with me. I'm, I mean, ultimately, I'm not against competition. I'm not against the free market. I'm not against people learning and copying each other. If people choose to make information public in any way, then other people can learn from that and compete with them on that basis. There's, there's no violation of rights when that happens, even though you would like people to be able to economically exploit this mythical right to reproduce something without competition that requires a legal monopoly which violates property rights that's my whole point it's very simple and it's 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 it's, it's rooted in by the way lots of randians agree with me you understand this this is not like you know, some people move my way from your side because they realize okay randianism our property rights principles can't sustain this anti this pro ip view I think there's, there's, I'll point out a fundamental error in, in what, at least what I think is a fundamental error. So, you know, be, be, the, in, there is, a, there is a, again, a kernel of truth. Patents are, are, are like monopolies in terms of their effect because there's an exclusion approach, right? But what, what you're doing is by, by say, you're saying that wanting to do something, let's say you, you want to compete with the mousetrap inventor, Right, you're wanting to do something per se creates a right. No, that, but that's what you're saying. You're, no, no, I, I, I know, what you're, I know where you're going, and I'm not saying that because I want to do it, it's fine. What I'm saying is, it's an but, all, but your example, your example is somebody wants to to copy that no, wanting, no, no, no. and I'm they want to, wanting. They, they want to use their physical resources to do it. So no, no, no. So, so, bear with me. Bear with me. You're, so, you're, let I'm, me just finish the point. You're, you're conflating also possession with property. And then you're saying that the desire no. to the desire to uh, to do something like to copy makes it a right. And, no, and no, none, I'm of not, that, no, none of that is, is given. None of that is I, given. I, I, I agree with you that that doesn't imply that, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm what I'm doing. But is that, I'm that's the heart of the, the root. Your argument against no, the, I'm, the I'm, monopoly. I'm, I'm appealing that. to what I think we agree with already, which is that is that property rights are meant to protect the security of your ability to use a resource that you've acquired uh, legitimately somehow. And, and that if you use the resource in a way that doesn't disturb other people's use of their resources, then you haven't done anything that justifies force being used against you. That's the core of the non-aggression principle or whatever, however Rand called it. But there again, um, you're, you're conflating, the, the, you're conflating, Possession with so you if you own the, the wood and the metal to make a mouse trap, yeah, it, it doesn't automatically give you the right to build John Galt's mouse trap. Here's the here here's where we disagree. Then that you just identified the core of the disagreement. I don't need a right to do whatever the fuck I want with my property. I can manipulate my resources in however I want. As long as I don't invade the borders of others' property, so this is your mistake. You think we have to operate by permission? I don't think so. No, it's I don't, not, I don't not need. By... I don't need a right to do anything. I only can. I only can be stopped if I'm violating someone's rights. We but operate, then... in my view of the world, the libertarian view of the world. We operate by right, <coughs> not by permission. We're not living in a totalitarian world where we have to run around getting fucking permission from everyone, getting rights to do things. If I own resources, wood, copper, metal, whatever, I don't need John Galt's permission to do whatever I want with it. That's your so, mistake. So if you, own, if you own a gun and, and the bullets in the gun and yeah. you decide to, to shoot somebody, put, put, those, put your bullet into that person's body. Yeah. Well, by, by, your, by, the, by what you just stated. No, no, listen, I was very careful what I said. So – in that case, it's not my ownership of the gun that is limited. It's my action. My action is invading his property rights, and the reason I can't shoot the gun in his direction is because the ejection of that bullet will go into his property and use his resources without his permission. That's what I don't have the right to do. But my point is when I fabricate, when I re manipulate the resources that I own in my own factory in a certain configuration, 
unless that trespasses against the borders of John Galt's fa- fa- factory of products, he doesn't have a right to stop me. See what, well, you're, doing, I, what, what you're doing there again is it's, it's a it's a begging the question. No, that, you're begging. Uh, the, I think you're begging the question. I know what you're well, saying, but but what you're what you're saying is that that right the the right to re, that reproducing the mousetrap. No, because... I don't have a right to reproduce. I have the right to do anything I want. Don't you understand? I don't have to identify 17,000 different fucking rights with my property. My right no, but, is to do but, whatever but you, I want unless you, you can stop it. That's all. But you, you, you do. So this is what I'm saying. You're conflating possession. You possess the wood and no, the metal. No, I'm not conflating anything. <laughs> it, it, does, it doesn't. So, so we're, we're in an area where you're either... In, you're either infringing on the mousetrap inventor's rights or not. And I'm there's saying... No, that you there's no such argue. thing as infringing. That's question begging. Yeah, but that, that's what you're doing. And I'm saying I, I have approached it from the point that they're both material values. So I'm not question <sighs> begging. I've, I've made a case for it. What you're no. saying is you're, you're saying that you cannot use the, the... That possession gives you infinite ability to do something and i just showed you a case no, where it doesn't it's the other way around it's, it's the other way around i'm saying that ownership gives you the right to stop people from using your property without their permission that's all and, that's and and the mousetrap owner owns the right to, to the, re, the reproduction of the of that that is his material no. value so so I, so that so that's well, hold on that's that that's the core question so the guy that owns wood and steel and he fashions it to make a mousetrap let's say a new mousetrap okay now he I think you and I would both agree he owns the wood and the steel that he fashioned it into, right? Yes, now, but, he, but, doesn't, you, but he, doesn't, he doesn't own every use of it. The, the possession of the wood and the metal doesn't give him infinite... Uh, no, 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 but, but no. If, but you're, if, you're, you, you yourself agreed if there is some other right, then he is, is restricted in what he can do with that. And no, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but you're saying, no, he's not restricted in his right. He's restricted in his actions. What you're saying is that if if I own wood and metal and I fashion it into a new shape, that gives me more than the right to keep people from using my wood and my metal as, as they want. It gives me the right to keep them from using their wood and metal in a similar way. So you're saying that this intellectual property right arises from my arrangement of the patterns of these materials. So – in other words, by me using my stuff in a creative new way, I gain a property right in other people's resources because I can no, stop. No, you, you, gain, you gain the right to reproduce that. You oh, understand? And, and, it's not and, reproducing. That's not how patent law – by the way, patent law has nothing to do with reproducing. That's copyright law. I'm not but, trying to get into the weeds with you, but patent law says that I can't independently come up with the same idea for my mousetrap because you came up with it first, even if I didn't learn it from you, it's not reproducing. It's just using my stuff in a certain way. That's all patent law says is that the owner of a patent can stop people from using their resources in a certain way. And by the yeah. way, he doesn't and, and, even and, have and to that, have his own. And that's that's the point. The ownership of those materials does not automatically. You you have to make the case that if you own the material, that, that like the the bullet and the gun example, which which you. You agree with in, in that case. So the same thing applies, and, and I've made the case no, no, that no. this so is let, also let, a material value. So let, let, you, let, you let, have to you either if you have to disagree with that, you have to say it's not a material value, which is okay. what I think you're saying. That may be where let, the let, fundamental. Let, let me let me try to clarify one thing, uh, and then we can maybe I'll let you close out. Um, when I say you own a bullet and a gun, to me ownership doesn't mean the right to use it any way you want. But you just because, said that, that he has the, the right to use the wood and the metal any way he wants. Yes, and that's, so, because, that's an implication. So, so ownership simply means the right to exclude people from using your stuff without your permission. That's all it means. So given that but, right… But there are, there are limits to it that… that no, you, there, there actually are no limits to it. But there, are li- there are limits to every kind of property and and no just like I, di- I disagree i disagree Th- well, this is this is the fun there are no limits to pro- there are limits to this is why i said earlier there are limits to actions not the property so if let me let me just say this you don't have to agree but ownership of a gun means that i can prevent other people from using it that's all it means okay it's it's sort of like the the, the free speech idea which we sometimes say like if I have free speech, it doesn't mean I can go on your property and say what I want. It means I can 
It means that if I speak on my property, I'm not violating your property rights. But, but what you're saying is that, that th there is a sphere of action that is yeah, that, protected. That's, actually, that's metaphorical. I never use that concept. But, it's, but that's, what you're, that's what you're saying because we, we are having a no, discussion. No, I'm not saying it. Uh, what I'm well, saying is that ownership – no, listen. I, I know what I'm saying. I'll tell you what I'm saying. You don't need to say, say it for me. I'm saying that if I own property rights – Okay, which means I own my body and I own other resources, which I have property rights in, which gives me specifically, legally speaking, the right to exclude other people from using those resources without my permission. Then that that usually and impl by implication gives me the ability to use them by and large in a, what you might call a sphere of action without permission. And that's the point is the same that if, if the it's not the same it's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the mousetrap the mousetrap owner uh, so you you have to he, if he has a, the the rights with the material value of reproduction no of that, he doesn't he doesn't own it you can't own it. that's I, the I, question begging to say you own a reproduction no, right I, I made i made the case that it's a material value and if it's a material value then th th there is a context in which there is there are rights associated with that well, and, and that's, when, what, when, that, that's where we disagree when, when those come yeah when, when those come into conflict with the guy who owns the, the wood and the metal then the the there's a and, and they do and they do come in, i'm glad you yes. acknowledge they come into conflict which they means do. that ip rights conflict with is just like wealth just like if you inflate money you reduce the purchasing power of the people's money just like if you have positive welfare rights, they don't come for free. They come but, at the expense of negative rights, and your rights, IP rights, rights come, come at the expense of tangible property rights. So no, that's fine. No, that you no, that. rights come. There are material values, and each one has a sphere where it is, where which is controlled. The, the user, and so I'm saying that John Galt has his sphere, and the owner of the of the metal and the wood has their sphere. And now it's a matter of saying if if both are valid. We have to figure out at, at what point does this this they're, matter? But the, but and they're not both valid because they're in, incompatible, and so I, they're, I, they're I, both material. They're both material values. Well, I, I will take Ayn Rand, and I will agree with her that you don't own an existent object that you rearrange. You only own the things you rearrange. And I will agree with Ayn Rand that the initiation of physical force against physical property is wrong. And but she, she I, also I do, says that you own the values, and you, she you was. Create. That's why she was. Incoherent and well, schizophrenic, and so I think I disagree. With I think Ayn I think Rand. you're cherry picking. You're, you're taking parts of Rand you agree with, but the the, the I am because she's. More, but I agree. More, I am. I, I agree with you. I am cherry picking because the, the, Ayn Rand had an incompatible, incoherent philosophy. That's why she was an anarchist and a minarchist at the same time, and that's why she was against IP. She, she, and was, pro -IP never an, she was never an anarchist. Oh, if you read Atlas Shrugged, Galt's Galt is anarchist, and you know it. Come on. Nope. Uh, I, I don't. Where's the, where's the government in Gulf's Gulch? There was a judge. Okay, well, judges, anarchists are not against law, dude. There you I go. Mean, so, so the the point is. No, I, no, it's to, not to there. Say, I go. It's there. To, you go. To say to say that it was there's anarchy being recommended or advocated is is is, is a mistake. I mean, I I don't see any other way around that. But anyway. Uh, I think it's been a great discussion, and I, I enjoyed it. it. I enjoyed it too. It was fun. I, you put up with my bullshit and my uh, my bellicosity, so you have a strong well, I, uh, temperament. I think that uh, you've been you've been fair. Um, I, I, I appreciate the the candid sharing of uh, ideas. You know, we don't have to agree on everything. I think we can still have uh, discussions in the future. As I said, if you want to really engage on topics that are closer to your heart, the, which which laws and stuff. I'll be happy to to uh, introduce you to a couple of people who are very much better at it, at it than I am. I'm not the expert there, uh, I, but I do I do believe I've made my case that th there is a moral case for intellectual property. You may disagree, and and people in your audience can certainly. I hope they will at least. I hope they've at least heard a different perspective, and if they if they want to engage with the ideas, they they know where to go. Uh, this, I've also put my. Facebook page up on the thing. Hopefully, it's it's readable. I don't know if it is or not. Um, also, my discuss handle. If anybody wants to uh, see what I've been up to, and uh, by all means, I would encourage anyone to to reach out. And this whole thing about the anonymity part, Stefan, it's it's only because I have a professional life. I do I do things outside of this. I I'm an entrepreneur. I do lots of other things, and I, I deal with people in in that context that has nothing to do with. Um, with uh, political philosophy and so on.
think your car alarm just went off. No, I'm outside. It's sort of, no, I totally appreciate that. And you notice I didn't pick on you about that. Uh, I, so. I, wanted, I wanted to, if anyone's wondering about it, I just wanted to set the stage there that it's, it's not that I, I would, I would be happy to meet with you and, and have an open discussion. It's just that because I do a lot of other things where politics and philosophy don't enter the picture, uh, I deal with employees and suppliers and customers and we, we don't, I'm the old school type. We don't get into politics. We don't get into religion. We, we kind of do business. And that's where we create values for each other. I understand it. All right, my brother. I enjoyed it. And let's, ch let's chat later. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.